Institute, uh, NDTP Dublin Midlands Hospital NCHD research competition. So this year we're going, it's going to be, it's bi-located. So we have uh, here in St. James's where all the oral presentations are going to take place. And there's also another community in Tullamore Hospital who are joining us online. To start off, uh, I'll just introduce myself. So uh, Dara Shields is my name. I'm a consultant in emergency medicine at St. James's Hospital of one of the NDTP co-leads. And my other co-lead is Rob Eager, who's busy uh, in Tullamore and he'll, he'll come in um, during, during the session to introduce our second speaker. So the schedule today is we have two speakers who are going to talk to us initially about uh, research. So David Mockler is one of our TCD librarians here um, at St. James is, is going to talk to us about systematic reviews and an overview of same. And following that then uh, from John Moore, we're going to be joined by Nicola Fay. And uh, Nicola Fay is a HSE librarian based in Tullamore. And she's going to uh, bring it back to if you have a research question, how do you know whether it's actually worth pursuing? How do you look at the, the data? And I, I'm, I'm sure that David and Nicola uh, both will give us wonderful uh, insight into how to get started in research. We'll follow on that then with the presenters who are all well established in, in, in how to do uh, research. And they're going to highlight some of the wonderful research that's going to, that's taken place across, across the group. So each site had many um, entrants into, into this competition, but we were only able to select one entrant from each site. And as such, we'll have six, six presentations. Alongside that, we also have poster presentations. So for people who are joining us virtually, that will be uh, that will be shown virtually uh, at around about seven seven thirty. For people here physically in St James's, we have two touch screens outside uh, with the posters. Uh, they'll display automatically for ninety seconds, and if you want to change them, then two two touches on the right of the screen will move forward, and two touches on the left will move things uh, backwards. All right. Also joining us today is the Chief Academic Officer for the group, Professor Martina Hennessy. And uh, Martina will introduce herself later, but she has the, the honor of judging the oral presentations today. Um, before I hand you over to David uh, Mockler, I'd just like to thank uh, Kevin. Thompson, who's our IT uh, TCD specialist here. So any issues with the IT, we're going to blame Kevin and not me, but I know that's not going to happen. And also Joe Finneran, who you would have all been in contact with, uh, who has uh, organized things at a group level, and then Irene Moran, who's organized things at a site level here. All right, so the plan is that we will uh, about quarter to six, we'll have our first speakers. That will bring us up to about seven, seven fifteen. Uh, there'll be food served, the judging of the competition, and then the announcement of the winner. So it promises to be a, a lovely evening. So first of all, I'm going to just introduce uh, David Mockler, who's going to uh, uh, join us. And the title of uh, David's talk is uh, Systematic Reviews and Overview. Thanks, David. Thank you, Professor Shields. Ah, good afternoon, everyone. It was still afternoon. Um, I'm David Mokler. I'm a medical librarian here in Trinity, and I get involved in quite a lot of research. In fact, I think I'm going to move out of the librarian kind of end of things and more into the information specialist end of things, but uh, that's for me to worry about, not you. Um, just being an information specialist means you're more involved with research and that kind of things and how you handle information. So I find my role here in Trinity is actually moving away from the library itself, so I'm not really concerned with what's on the shelves, etc., but what people are doing and the kind of research they're doing. So it gets me involved and I quite like it. And it gives me an overview of what's going on here in James and within Trinity. So actually I quite like it. I kind of sit above everything a bit meta in that respect. But anyway, this first slide I've put up, this is just actually it's nearly a history of information, shall we say, or a history of my profession. 
So what we have here on the left-hand side is we have a Victorian journal or a Victorian gentleman reading his journal. So he could be a scientist or a doctor. But the point being, he only probably ever had to read one, two, three or four journals. OK, there wasn't that many. As we came up to the war, the second image, the number of journals had increased, but you could stay on top of information. So you might get uh, journals in your specialist area and you could read all those journals. The information overload wasn't so bad. So what happened then after the war was we had an information explosion. So we have the third guy there dealing with multiple filing cabinets full of articles and journals and all that kind of stuff. And then we have the guy at the end, which is where we're at now. We're swamped with information. OK, so part of my job is to make uh, this information more accessible, more relevant. And when I do it with you guys, it actually feeds into patient care and all that kind of stuff. So it's quite an important role, so I, I quite I like to embrace it. So the literature searching process, which is what I'm concerned with, according to Samuel Butler, is not an exact science, but an art. OK, well, what a systematic review and what I try to do or what they try to do in systematic reviews is make it more scientific, more systematic. We should try to think of the process as a journey, not a destination. OK, so hopefully by the end of this presentation, you should know what a systematic review is and why it differs from a traditional review. We'll, I'll outline the steps involved in the systematic review process and actually where I can give input as well. So it's not a process where we kind of launch you and expect you to kind of go on this journey alone. There is help that you can access all along the way if you do decide to do a review or any kind of research really. I'll show you how you can identify keywords, subject terms for your search, whatever project you're doing. I'll show you how to uh, minimize bias as well, which is quite an important piece of work when you do review as well. Now reviews have all sorts of biases built in, but we try to eliminate most of them when we do it systematically. Um, um, so also talk about locating filters that you can use in your strategy. So when you do searching as well, so if, depending on what kind of search, if you're looking at effectiveness of an intervention, you're gonna look at randomized control trials. If they're not available, you go to observational studies, that kind of thing. So we use filters to filter the evidence that we get as well just to make our results more um, relevant. Um, so you should be able to evaluate the quality of your strategy and also be able to report what you've done. Because the thing with a systematic review, it's quite explicit. You, you, you literally write down everything you do. You explain all your methods. It means that if somebody comes back to replicate your review, they should be able to follow all your steps. So it's quite an explicit thing. So what is this talk not about? It's not about undeciding the question. OK, so if you have a systematic review question, this is I will talk about how you can formulate a question, but I'm not going to say what the question is. Um, I'm not going to talk about the termination of quality of the studies either or analysis of the studies or reporting of the results and all that kind of thing. OK, so to get started, then we talk about reviews and different kinds of reviews. So what are we dealing with here? So a more traditional review would have been called a narrative review. So that generally used to crit critique and summarize a body of literature. And it draws conclusions too about the topic. It is typically selective in the material it uses. Now selective means whoever's doing the research, they're selecting. So when you see selective, you're gonna see bias, okay? So it's a biased review from the get go. Doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong or the insights are wrong, but it's not necessarily the most comprehensive type of review. The systematic review, on the other hand, employs a more rigorous and well-defined approach. So once you actually start that review, you're actually in that process and all those steps are clearly defined. So you can't really step outside the process. So it's actually quite a nice thing to do because it's all been done before, the steps are well laid out. Um, a systematic review aims to provide a complete exhaustive summary of the current literature relevant to a research question. And the thing about a review, a systematic review as well, it tends to be a question, the title, okay? Uh, a meta-analysis, it is, does form part of a systematic review, but there can be a standalone uh, review as well. Um, it's largely a statistical technique that involves taking the findings from several studies, could be randomized control trials or whatever, on the same subject and analyze them then using standard statistical procedures. Now, if you do not have that expertise, there are people you can call upon, 
okay? So again, if it's a thing, you can do it up to a certain stage, but your statistics aren't your strong game. You can always involve another team member that may have a good uh, in, a knowledge of statistics. So again, it's quite a group thing or quite a team thing if you do want to get involved. And you can get a couple of people involved as well. That's the great thing about it. It's never a thing you have to do by yourself. You can always get a team involved. So for instance, I can come in as the information specialist, somebody else can do statistics. And you can just use your subject knowledge then to get the review over the line. Now, we can also have metasyntheses, uh, which is a non-statistical technique used to integrate, evaluate, and interpret the findings of multiple qualitative research studies. You can have mixed methods reviews as well, quantitative and qualitative, and they're quite informative as well. So to compare a systematic with a traditional or narrative review, uh, you can see it there side by side. So the systematic will be a scientific approach uh, to review. Uh, and the narrative depends on the author's inclination. That might be a bit harsh, but again, that's the way it kind of falls down. Um, the criteria is determined at the outset with a systematic review. So before you go into the whole thing, you, you actually outline, you, you produce a protocol, which is like your research proposal, and you outline the kind of studies you're interested in, the kind of searches you're going to run, how you're going to analyze the data, how you're going to extract it. So all that's kind of laid out beforehand. It's not like a, a narrative review where you just kind of launch yourself in, you have a good idea of what you're looking for. Um, so with the narrative review, the author selects their own criteria. Um, now, the bit I'm involved in is, is the comprehensive search for relevant articles. So we don't stick with one database. We use multiple databases. We use quite comprehensive strategies. There's all different ways we can make these searches quite good. Um, again, with the narrative, there's no kind of hard and fast rules around. It can search any database, any information sources that you have. Um, with a systematic view, you have explicit methods of appraisal and synthesis. Um, methods not usually applied in a narrative review and a meta analysis can also be conducted in a systematic review and sometimes with a narrative review it can actually be quite difficult to replicate it so they're less scientific and less less comprehensive so what are the advantages of doing a systematic review well you're going to reduce bias um, you can replicate all the methods that have been used um, you can resolve conflicts between or controversy between conflicting studies, so you may get insights there. Identify gaps in current research. Now, sometimes you can do review and you may have no firm conclusions, but what you do have are indications of where research should be carried out. And I'm actually involved in quite an interesting review where they're trying to establish what the research priorities are in dementia. So one of the things we're doing to establish the research priorities are we're looking at all the reviews that are done on dementia and at the end of each review in the conclusion they have indications of where further research is needed so in addition to doing this looking at all the reviews and seeing what they've established as priorities we're also going to do a survey of health experts in that field as well so we combine the two and overall we get an overall list of the research priorities and as a matter of interest they also did it in chat gbt just to see what they did, <laughs> what would come out. And in fact, I was quite surprised. And I think that kind of artificial intelligence may come into play uh, quite a bit more when it comes to doing research. Now, I wouldn't rely on it to kind of produce all the kind of research priorities, but what it did do, which I found highly interesting, was it broke down the relevant areas where research will be conducted. And that in addition to what the research we're doing in systematic reviews and the survey, it actually, it's a nice combination. I must admit that putting the three together, but again, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm going off on a tangent there. Um, so that was, you can also identify gaps in current research and it re provides a reliable basis for decision-making as well. Generally, when you do a systematic review, because of the way you've done it, they're generally referred to as the gold standard. Okay, so this is gonna be, if you have a systematic review on a topic, it's what refers to the gold standard. So the very best evidence you can get on a topic. Now, you may disagree with this. I know that some clinicians do not like systematic reviews. They find them too prescriptive. But again, I think the insights again are quite valuable. Uh, <clears throat> there is increased or, uh, interest in systematic reviews, and there's a number of reasons for that. There's just too much information. Okay, and you, you know and realize this yourselves. It is so hard to keep on top of information these days. Government has also taken an interest, particularly in health costs, so it's good to do reviews, see how much things cost, are, are they effective, 
and all that kind of stuff. So we've got the National Centre for Pharmacoeconomics, and they do quite a lot of reviews on new drugs and stuff, that kind of stuff. Um, variations in practice as well. So you can establish variations in practice on why people are doing it some ways and other people are doing it different ways. The public wants information as well. Now, the Corcoran um, database, which is full of Corcoran systematic reviews, that's freely available to everyone in Ireland. I'm not sure if everyone in Ireland realizes that, but I mean, all those systematic reviews in the Corcoran database, we have a national subscription. Okay, so everyone has access to. So People are accessing this information. They may not understand what they're reading, but they can see that the information is there. And the increased interest is also facilitated by advances in technology. So we now have software that will really reduce the amount of time that you spend doing a review. Things like EndNote and Covenants, they reckon, will reduce the time it does to, review, to do a review by a third, okay? So it's, it's quite nice the way they're bringing this technology forward as well to support reviewing. Now, again, I will offer support if you do approach me and you do want to do research or do review, I can guide you in all the software and, and node and covenants and all that kind of stuff. Now, systematic reviews are not the be all and end all. They do have some limitations. The, res uh, the results may be inconclusive. And again, that may just point that further research needs to be done or the research that has been done is not good enough. There may be no or too few trials or evidence to reach a conclusion. But again, these are valid results as well. Okay, so it does. Put, and again, in the context, if you're doing a PhD or a master's and you've established that there's not enough research in this area, by that very basis, you've established that your PhD or your MD is worth doing. Okay, so in that respect, the systematic review can be very important. And I've had a couple of MDs and PhDs Order lit review, do a systematic review because that means they're capturing all the information that's available. Um, the trials themselves may be of poor quality, okay, and that's not something we can deal with, <laughs> okay. We just have to accept the information or the evidence we get. Uh, the intervention may be too complex to be tested by a trial, and practice does not change just because you have the evidence of effect or or effectiveness. And that's why we need these institutes, these institutes that translate that research into the bedside. Now, the steps for, so like I mentioned previously, it is quite a structured thing once you go into a review, okay? And these are the steps that have been laid out. So the first step event is you formulate the question, what do you want to do research on? Now, I mean, that's their step, but that actually can be quite an involved step. So you may have an idea of what you want to do research on, and then you do investigative pilot searches, and you may decide, oh, there's too much work being done there, not enough work, there's not enough evidence. Okay, so that can be quite a, a to and fro type process till we finally, finally establish what the question's going to be. You then plan the review. So planning the review can be putting a protocol or a research proposal together. The other thing you need to do is to establish that a review on this topic hasn't been done before. Now, if a review has been done, it's not the end of the world. If a review that's four or five years old is probably out of date, and can, you can restart that review because we tend to review evidence every four or five years, and that's probably about the, the time limit for a review for its relevancy. Um, so once you plan the review, the next thing then is you launch yourself into doing the searches proper, and that's probably the stage you will involve me in, okay? And then we move on to the screening process, which is a kind of an unbiased selection and abstraction process. Then there's the critical appraisal of the data, synthesis of the data, may include a meta-analysis, and then the interpretation of the results. So you can see it all laid out there. Now, one thing I have done, and I will show you at the end of the session, is we've put up a lit guide on the Trinity Library um, website that goes through all these individual steps. And for each step, we've put in lots of uh, guidance and information sources and places you can go to to get more information. And we also give our own uh, uh, tips and hints on how you can make your search more effective. So I will show you that at the end of the session. Okay, so here we have the flow chart for doing a review. So at the very top, we have the question formulation, and then we have a scoping or a pilot search. This is just to establish that, you know, we, we can get this off the ground, or does it need any tinkering or any modifications or edits, just to get that question over the line. We then draw up our research proposal, our pro protocol, 
and you can register, register the protocol as well. So what you're doing is you're establishing that this is my idea and uh, I've put it on, you've registered it online so anyone can see it. So you've kind of established your mark in your territory as it were, that this is gonna be your re review and this is the area you're gonna be working in. So you can write up your protocol and you can put that in a register and I'll show you one later, Prospero. We then go to our full searching and this is where the software starts coming into play. So we do our searches online and databases. We gather our results in software called EndNote, and then we shift them over into screening software called Covenance. And this is what makes your life so much easier. So within Covenance, you can do your title and abstract screening. You can do your full text retrieval, your full text screening. Um, you can do additional searching and it really handles the whole process. It produces, a, are you familiar with the Prisma diagrams? You know, as you go to review, so you started off with so many, then you screened and then you got rid of so many, then you went to full text and you got rid of so many, then you went to your data extraction. So that whole process is automated. You don't keep an eye on anything. All the numbers are recorded, your reasons for excluding things, your reasons for including things, all that's handled in confidence. So it's really, really nice software. So you kind of whiz through this stage now until you get down to, um, your data extraction and then your, your meta-analysis or whatever you're going to do. And if the review has gone on for a long time, which it can do, I've had reviews that have lasted two years, one year, whatever. Sometimes what happens when we reach the publication stage and we submit, they say, listen, will you run a search just to update it, just to make sure there's no information. So that's a step that sometimes surprises people that you have to rerun a search. But again, if it's like a year, year and a half down the line, you may want to see if there's new information available. But again, you just contact me and I can help you in that instance. So asking an answerable question. Now, generally when we do systematic reviews, we're looking at, at the effectiveness of an intervention. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be about effectiveness, but by and large, most of them tend to be about effectiveness. Now, it could be the effectiveness of a therapeutic intervention, it could be drug, whatever, um, but it could be a diagnostic intervention as well. So all these are coming into play. So you're looking at kind of questions like, does an intervention work, not work? Um, who does it work for? Who does it not work for? All those kind of questions can be asked. So uh, how does the intervention work? Is the in intervention appropriate and in all cases? Is the intervention feasible? Are the intervention and comparison relevant? So all these are kind of relevant questions in the systematic review area. And generally, the way we like to frame a question, especially around effectiveness, is a format called PICO, P-I-C and O, okay? And that's generally how you should frame your question. Think of these separate elements. So the P is a description of the population. Uh, I is an identified intervention. C is an explicit comparison. And then the relevant outcomes are O. So if you think of formulating your question in that format, you can also put a T, there's variations on this, there's spice and eclipse and all that kind of stuff. And they're on the library webpage. So here's an example of a question. This kind of question I normally would get as well is what is the best strategy to prevent smoking in young people? Now, when I see this kind of question coming in, I kind of dread it, <laughs> okay? It's too time consuming, it's too broad, it's not um, explicit enough, okay? But generally, it's a good basis by which to start. So when we want to do a pilot searching or a scoping search, and you can start quite broad like that, but generally you would refine the question, probably end up um, with something like this. Are mass media, school-based or community-based interventions effective in preventing smoking in young people? So rather than looking at all interventions, they've now picked a particular intervention and a comparison, and they're looking at that. So systematic reviews address clear and answerable research questions, okay, rather than a general topic or problem of interest. Another example here, does oral health education reduce the risk of tooth decay amongst children on, aged under six years compared to no oral health education? And again, when you look at these, you can break them down. So your intervention is oral health uh, education, your population is children under six years of age. Okay, your comparison is no oral health education and your outcome is reduce the risk of tooth decay. So you see within that PI, CNO, it's in there. And again, if you look at the other one, now this one doesn't have 
I know it does it, all the elements. So your population is young people. Um, your intervention is community-based mass media. Your comparison is school-based mass media. And you're hoping to reduce or prevent smoking in young people. And again, if you were doing up your protocol, you might define what your population is, okay? So you might say young people are 18 and below, or you might say it's like 25 and below, and all these kind of things. So again, all this can be addressed in your protocol, etc. Now, breaking that down, okay, so do you problem your population of young people, and here if they define it under 25 years of age, there's your intervention, television, radio, newspapers, etc. Your comparison is your school-based interventions, and these are the outcomes of interest. Now, they have an extra one here at the end. You can see it's people up there, and then in brackets you have T, and T is types of studies. Sometimes you'll see it as M, methodology. And this one, they're looking for randomized control trials, control before and after studies, and time series design. So we can filter for those as well. Okay? And that's the basis by which my search strategy is constructed as well. So the question feeds into the search strategy. Okay, so that's why they're both important. So moving from question then to searching, the searcher needs to translate the question into a systematic search method. There is always negotiation as well. So it's, uh, I find we're always to and fro and at this stage, will you put this in? Uh, why didn't you put that in? And I will sometimes go, I didn't need to put it in or I forgot to put it in. Okay, so that kind of conversation happens. Um, you also need to determine which information resources would best respond to the information you're seeking. So we have a suite of databases that we can choose from. Now we have a kind of a hardcore that we will use the whole time. We have Embase, uh, Medline or PubMed and Sinal. And then in around that core, we can mix depending on what the review is about. Now the search itself should be sensitive. Um, it should look in a number of different places, not just a single database. It should minimize bias as well. So we think about finding studies that aren't in the major source like PubMed or Medline. That's why we cast our net wide when we're doing this searching. And be efficient. Start looking in place you expect to have the highest or most relevant yield. Now getting started. Um, and before you even consider this stage, you might actually see, is, is there a systematic review in progress or already completed on the topic. So you have a number of places you can go. You can go to Prospero, which I've mentioned previously. Now Prospero is a register for systematic reviews. It's run by the CRD in Sheffield Centers for Center for Reviews and Dissemination. Okay. And it's a big school of information in the health sciences and they run this Prospero. I'll show it to you now in a second. Okay, Embase is one of our biomedical databases that we have a subscription to in the Corcoran Library, which I mentioned previously. So again, you just go in and see if a review has been done. So just to show you Prospero, if it let me, can this let me out, Kevin? Oh yeah. So Prospero accepts registrations for systematic reviews, rapid reviews, and umbrella reviews, okay? And they don't do for scoping or literature reviews. So you can search it there. So I'll just put in um, just put in chronic fatigue syndrome there and I click on go. So it's found 285 records for chronic fatigue syndrome. So what you're seeing here, these are prospective reviews. You see review ongoing, review ongoing, et cetera. And this one is actually being completed and published. Okay. So what you can establish is a review ongoing in my area. Um, if not, I'm not going to touch it. It's already done. But when you start looking at some of the dates here, um, so you notice there's 2014, for instance, that's been completed, but you may go back to 2017. And this review was completed and not published. So again, that's a review that you might say, okay, well, I could do that. It's been four years or five years, whatever. So you could actually go and do that as well. Okay. So what you're establishing is the review current or is there one published in that area? And that's what Prospera does. It's quite nice. But when you go in, what you're looking at is a research protocol. Okay. And what you see here is the citation itself for the protocol. So what was the review question? What searches are you going to do? Types of study to be included. So your inclusion criteria, your exclusion criteria, all that is outlined here. Condition being studied. Here's your P, I, C, 
and O. Okay, so you're actually outlining all the outcomes of interest, additional outcomes, what data you're going to extract, your risk of bias, how you're going to establish that, and your strategy for data synthesis, all of those stuff. So even um, going in and having a look, it actually allows you to see how you can structure your own review and what kind of outcomes you might want to do or what kind of data synthesis, or what kind of data extraction. So you can just look at similar kind of reviews that have been done or been proposed to be done and go in there and have a look. So people say, oh, I don't want to put a proposal together. It's too much work. It's not actually, it's, you get a template, you get your PI, your CO, you just put in the paragraphs as you see them, okay? You come and you talk to me about doing your uh, search and all that, and it's quite an easy thing. But what it really good at is when you come to do your screening, if you're doing it as a group or a team, you all know what the exclusion criteria are. You all know what the inclusion criteria, you know what you want to extract. So you're all singing from the same hymn sheet as well. So it's quite a nice thing to do to put a proposal together. I lost myself now. <laughs> Okay, so we're looking at Prosper or Embascope, and this will allow you to identify if the review is viable. Okay, so nobody's done one previously, or they're out of date if they have been done. It also allows you to establish what the key, key papers are in that area as well. So what it's nice to do sometimes is when I put a strategy together, I will send it back to the researcher and I say, listen, do you want to test that strategy? And I ask them to establish if it's finding the key papers in that area, or the gold standard. Um, and it also identifies as keywords you can use in your own searching as well. Now, another example here, what is the effectiveness of cognitive behavior therapy and chronic fatigue syndrome? And again, you see the PICO broken down for us. So patients with chronic for the P population, patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, intervention, CBT, and the comparison not mentioned. Okay, so you just say other therapies or placebo. And again, that can be in part of your selection criteria as well, your inclusion or exclusion criteria, and outcomes reduce symptoms. Now, one thing I will say when you do this PICO format is we never include outcomes in our searching. Okay, if you want to see if, if an intervention makes a thing better or worse, you don't want to build that into your strategy. You want the answer to emerge. Okay, you don't want to search for the answer. You want it to emerge from the literature. Okay, it's a natural consequence. So we tend to leave outcomes out when we're doing searching because it puts bias in. Now, for this particular um, systematic review, they did have a selection criteria. So they have RCTs involving adults with primary diagnosis of CFS assigned to a CBD condition compared with usual care or another intervention alone or in combination. So you kind of contextualized in your review. So what kind of searches can you do when it comes to searching the database? Well, there's two types. You can do a keyword search, and generally your keyword search, it's everyday searching. That's what we do when we go to Google or we go to a library catalog. It's the words we use every day, what we call a keyword search. But there is also a subject search, which most people never do, okay? But in the context of a systematic review, you're expected to do both. Um, keywords, the choice of keyword terms should include consideration of synonyms, related terms and variant spellings. Okay, I'll come back into this in more detail in a second. Now these indexing terms, these subjects are subject terms or subject headings. These are selected from the database's controlled vocabulary or thesaurus with appropriate explosions. And again, it's a bit of an abstract concept, but I will come back to it in a second as well. So just talking about keyword search, and generally when you go into a database and you're doing a keyword search you're, and you don't specify, it will search a number of different areas or fields. Okay, so it can search for the journal title, it could be the words in the title, words in the abstract, it could be the author names or author assigned keywords. It's always better when you go in to specify where you want to search. That just el it eliminates so much noise and so many articles you don't want to see. So the best thing to do is actually say search and title or abstract, okay, if it's available. And it is available in most databases. Now, just to show you what keyword searching is, 
Okay, here we have the title, how and why do occupational therapists use the OT seeker evidence and database? When these journals come out, all the articles are looked at and we have what we call indexers that will look at it and pick out the keywords. I'm sure it's all done online by computers these days with machine learning. But what they mean by keywords is that not every word in the title is indexed, okay? So they just index keywords, okay? So occupational therapist, OT seeker, evidence and database, they're extracted and they're put into a title index, okay? Once you put something into an index, it then becomes searchable. So again, if I go back to this database and try to find OT seeker in title, it will find this as a keyword search, it will find this article and any other article with OT seeker in title. Now they do the exact same with the abstract. They extract the keywords like they do in title and they do the same with the authors, they'll extract the authors, okay? So that's what keyword searching is. That's what it means. You're picking up on keywords in the title or in the abstract. <clears throat> and like I said, the authors will be extracted as well. So keyword searches look for words or phrases in any field within a database's record. It could be title, author, abstract, etc. You also specify which field you wish, in which you wish to search. And as I said, title or abstract are, are good for this. Keyword searches can results can result. Uh, keyword searches can find results that use your search term in a different way than you intended. So banking using reference to airplanes, for example, not finance. So if you don't know what banking and airplanes have got in common, it's actually when it comes to uh, coming in to land above an airport and they bank and the air traffic control will let them down. So sometimes you find that you're doing a search and next thing your keyword has been used in a totally different context to what you expected, okay? So that sometimes happened. Some other problems with keyword searching, plurals, child or children, okay? Different spellings, you have aesthetic with EA, without the A, different terminology, pavement or sidewalk, adrenaline or epinephrine, okay, American, European terminology, and prefixes, prenatal, one word, prenatal, two words, prenatal, hyphenated. So all these come into play. So it can be quite a complex thing putting this search together. <coughs> and you also have things like uh, spelling variations, synonyms, different ways of describing the same element. Example here, I'm using CBT. <laughs> We have behavior with a U, behavior without a U. We have behavior, behavioral, and again, that's got a U and without a U format. So all these are relevant when it comes to keyword searching. And that's what I mean. Sometimes people say, oh, it's quite a simple search. But when you actually sit down and start trying to figure out all the stuff, it can sometimes, you get very good at doing crosswords, okay, by the end of this, okay. Now that's keyword searching and some of the problems. Now, the other thing I mentioned was subject searching, okay? Subject searching attempts to solve the problems of using different terms to describe the same concept or process. Now, example here I use is World War I. For example, let's say you're trying to find all the information you can on the topic of World War I, okay? So what you find is there's so many different ways to describe it. World War I, First World War, WW1, World War I, as opposed to one. The Great War, War to End All Wars, etc. And that list goes on and on and on. So when they started organizing information and making it more accessible, they realized that this was a problem. People were writing about the same topic, but they were all using different terminology. <coughs> so what they decided to do was they would develop subject headings, okay? This LCSH, that's the Library of Congress subject heading. So they essentially established their own way of doing it and the big databases have done it as well, et cetera, et cetera. And what happens is if a book is submitted to the Library of Congress about any of the, uh, about the topic of World War I, and it can mention all these different things, they will all be assigned the same subject, okay? So what that means is if I go into the Library of Congress and I do a subject search, you'll find all these different variations. And that works the exact same in the database, okay? So you can have a subject and it captures lots of different things and you can do a subject search. Okay, now, sorry for the quality of the picture here. This is just a database record. And what it's highlighting is where, in yellow, is where my search terms are matching. So it's matching in title, in abstract, and these at the bottom, these are the subject terms that are being assigned. Okay, so that's where my searching occurs, title, abstract, and in these subject terms. So you're searching in three separate areas, essentially. Try and find records. 
Now, to find these subjects, all different databases, all, all databases are different. If you're using PubMed or Medline, we use medical subject headings, MeSH. If you're in Embase, which is our biggest biomedical database, we use Entry. Okay, and just show you what Entry. So I looked up, um, actually, I think I looked up Ireland, but what happens is when you go into these subjects, you'll find that they're arranged in hierarchies. These hierarchies are called trees, hence we have Entry, Embase Tree. And what you find is, you may, so if I looked up Ireland, I may decide that Ireland is where I want to be, but I could decide that I want to go up a tree, maybe to Western Europe, or even to Europe, or Eastern Hemisphere. And again, if you go to somewhere like Scandinavia, if you break that down, you'll have um, Norway, Finland, and Sweden in there. So you can go even more precise. So the more you go down a tree, the more precise your search becomes, you'll find less articles. The higher up a tree you go, the more articles you find, but it will be a broader search, okay? So even when you're looking up your subject terms, you can decide to go up and down a tree if you want to go more precise, less precise, etc. So subject headings describe the main topics of each article, and as you saw in that example, they assign them. So every article, anytime you go into a database and look at an article, you can have a look at the subject terms that, that have been assigned. Most databases offer a thesaurus that helps you identify these subjects. So as I said, in PubMed, it's called MESH, Medical Subject Headings. Enbase, it's M3. And SINAL, our other big database. SINAL is nursing, but it's AHL is Allied Health Literature. So it's one of our important ones as well. And they just call it SINAL Subject Headings. Subject headings help to standardize the way resources are indexed. And subject searching permits retrieval of articles on that subject, regardless of any of the keywords used. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the searching itself and the searching techniques that we use. So there's a couple of techniques we use. We've got Boolean operators, nesting, phrase searching, truncation and wildcards, and proximity operators. Now I'm not expecting you to kind of remember all these, but I just explain what they are and how they work. And even for your own knowledge. So if you want to do a simple search, if you were proposing to do some research, you want to do a bit of searching yourself, you can use these techniques. Now, in and, in and of themselves, they're quite simple, but it's when you start combining them, you can actually develop quite complex searches from them. So just talk, talk about them one by one, Boolean operators. Now, this takes me back to my intercert, or probably your junior cert maths, when we used to do set theory, we used to draw circles, Venn diagrams, and we'd have them intersecting. This is what Boolean logic is based upon. They're named after George Boole. He was a British mathematician. He actually worked down in UCC, so they named the library after the, down there, George, uh, the Boole Library. But he devised this system of logic, okay, that allows us to combine words and phrases together when searching. You can narrow or broaden a search, and there are three of them, and, or, and not. So go through them one by one. So and, and retrieves, retrieves documents in a database that contain all of the search terms. So the example here is steroid, steroids and sports. And that requires that only records that contain both the terms ter steroids and sports will be returned. So that's what the and is doing, okay? And focuses a search as it forces the database to return only documents that contain all terms. As for your own information too, when you go into Google and you type in, if you type in steroid sports, there's an implied and in Google. That's how Google operates, okay? So what we're here, here's our Venn diagram, concept A, steroids, concept B, a sport. It's where the two intersect, and that's what the and operator does. And if you and in a third element, then you have three circles intersect and then an even narrower subset. So the more you and in, the more precise your search becomes. So and reduces the number of items found. Now, in the context of doing our systematic review, if you remember back to the P, I, the C, and the O, what you end up with is P, and I, and C. That's how the and. So your population and the intervention and the comparison. Okay, so that's how we use and. Now, the other Boolean operator is or. Or will find documents that contain at least one of the terms searched for. So here I'm giving an example of cognitive behavior with the U and cognitive behavior without the U therapy. So just use the or to make sure we're capturing both those elements. This search will also return documents that contain both terms, which probably wouldn't occur unless somebody was bad at spelling. Okay, but there you go. Okay, so there's CBT with the U, CBT without the U and everything in blue, so the OR will broaden your search and include everything. 
Now, the thing with OR is we don't use it in a random or a haphazard way. We use it in relation to synonyms or acronyms, okay? So we have VAT or value-added tax, cannabis or marijuana, adrenaline or epinephrine. Again, that American Europe, that's a killer, really it is. When it comes to spellings and terminology, you have to consider everything. Dyslipidemia, um, the difference here, again, is just the spelling, an extra A in the second one. Um, a and E or emergency department. That's a, just a, a difference in terminology over time, but you're trying to capture everything. Uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis or ME or chronic fatigue syndrome or CFS. So you're seeing acronyms and different terminology coming into play there as well. Okay, so that's how we use the OR. Um, Another concept then is nesting. And nesting is in relation if you are going to use the OR Boolean operator. And it's just use of parentheses around elements of the search just to divide it into logical groups. So here we have French or France, just using the OR Boolean operator. So we just put that in parentheses. And the way the database looks at this is like us doing mathematical equations. You're always told, do the bit in brackets first. And that's exactly what the database does. So it does one set for French or France. And it does a second set then for theater or drama or performance. And then the two sets are rounded together. Okay, so that's what nesting is. It's just use of those parentheses. Okay. Now the third we operate, so we've had and and or, the third one is not. And the only thing I'll say about it is don't use it. Okay, but it's good if you want to exclude results. Um, but generally when we're doing systematic, we don't try and exclude results. Although I love using it in Google. Okay, so for instance, if you're interested in depression from a mental health perspective, not from a, an ec economic perspective, you would do something like depression, not economic. And again, if you're interested in viruses, but not computer viruses, you do something like virus, not computer. Now, like I say, don't use it. But when I do use it in Google, all you need to do is put a minus depression minus economic virus minus computer. Really neat trick. Um, Paris minus Hilton. Mars minus bars, all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, so not will focus the search by reducing the number of articles returned. And that's it, concept A, not concept B, not reduce the number of items found. Now, there's a couple of other things. Again, they're all quite simple. Phrase searching allows you in a database to search for particular words in a particular order. So things like health care reform, World Health Organization, value added tax, okay? Now, if you didn't know, so to do a phrase search, you just put it into double quotes, okay? And again, that will work in Google and elsewhere. If you didn't put the double quotes on it, what you end up with is World Health Organization, but you also end up with World and Health and Organization as well. So it will search for both, okay? So phrase search will actually just search for that exact phrase. Now, practically one of my favorite things here, truncation and wildcards, I don't get out much. <laughs> okay, so truncation, this is useful when searching for singular and plural forms of a word. Okay, so it's just used for an asterisk and it tends to work across all the uh, big databases that we know, it doesn't work in Google. Okay, so the example here is tumor with an asterisk, so tumor, tumors, tumorous. Okay, so it searches for the tumor stem and any combination of letters after the or. Okay, so that's singular and plural. Now, the wildcard is slightly different. It tends to be within words, okay? So you can substitute one or zero characters or maybe more, okay? So with this, it's again, it's the same search, but we've just put in this. So it's now gonna search for the version with U in it as well. So you're getting tumor and tumors with the O-U-R, okay? And that's called a wildcard. And that bit at the end, that's just Okay, so truncation is asterisk, but that um, wildcard character can differ between databases. It can be a question mark, an asterisk, hash, or a dollar. So each individual database, if you just go in and go to the help section, it should tell you which one is which to use. Okay. Now, just to give you an example with that cognitive behavior therapy. So if I do this, you see, put the double quotes around it, so it's now searching for that as a phrase. Okay. And again, with the behavior, it put that dollar symbol in, so we'll search for the OR and the OUR. And it put after the OR, it put the asterisk, so we're getting behavior well as well. Okay. So that simple phrase translated into those four different elements. So it's quite, you see, it can be quite neat when you put all the elements together 
and it allows you to do cover a lot of ground. Now, I am not expecting you to produce this, okay? This is where you come and have a chat with me and we try and sort out how we get our strategy together and all that kind of stuff, okay? Proximity operators. Um, this is nice when you're doing keyword searching, so it allows you to search for variations. Now, generally, it's uh, proximity is a search technique used to find two words next to, near, or within a specified distance of each other within a document. Using such search operators may result in more satisfactory results than that are more relevant to the research needs than by just typing in desired. So rather sometimes than putting something into a phrase, you can do breast near three, within three. Now that number can vary. It could be near two, near five, near six, near seven, whatever you want. So breast near three cancer will find breast cancer, but it will also find cancer of the breast. Okay, so you're contextualizing breast and cancer together. Now that can differ between databases. So Embase, it's near, Medline, it's adjacent. Okay, ADJ3, Sinal, you have to drop it. So the tree becomes a two and the near becomes an N. So it's N2 and the web of science. Another big database we use that still uses the near as well. Now it doesn't work in PubMed. So when people ask me to do it searching in PubMed, I say this and I prefer to do it in Medline, which is essentially the same database, but it allows me to do this proximity searching. Now here's an example from one of my searches. So here we, the first line, line number one, cognitive behavioral therapy, that forward slash EXP means it's been searched for as a subject, okay? The second line is the keyword search. And what you see here is T-I-A-B-K-W. So it's searching in title, abstract, and author keywords, okay? And what we're looking for is cognitive behavior. Again, you see all the elements there within two words of therapy or treatment. And again, therapy, therapies, therapist, or treat, treat, treatment, or treatments, etc. And in the third line, we're combining our subject search and our number two search, our keyword search. So that's combining the keyword and the subject search together. Okay. Now, example. This is another example from uh, a review I did. So we were looking at gastroesophageal uh, cancers. And as you can see, there's very different, various different ways to describe gastroesophageal. And again, it's all down in spellings. But what I did here was adjacent three. Here we have cancer, neoplasm, tumor, tumors, adenocarcinoma, et cetera, et cetera. It's a really nice way of capturing all that information and trying to get it all together. Because if you had to list them all out individually, you would have an incredibly long, boring strategy. So it's a nice way of just summarizing things, getting things going. Now, to eliminate um, biases in your strategy, you can have confirmation bias, which we all have at some, in some shape or form. So people display this bias when they gather or remember information selectively or when they interpret it in a biased way. So it's like doing a search and suddenly you see all these results that are concur with the way you think. You go, yeah, I was right all along. But you need to delve in sometimes, okay? Um, including outcome concepts in your strategy as i mentioned previously putting outcomes into your strategy can lead to the introduction of this bias okay outcomes are better addressed in a protocol selection okay so when you do your protocol your outcomes these are what you want to include okay but you don't search for it specifically the other thing to try and avoid in your strategy is duplication okay so if you're looking at preeclampsia you don't need to include pregnancy in women Search okay because preeclampsia naturally occurs in that population, and again, meconium you don't need to put in neonates okay, just run it on meconium. So, it trying to eliminate duplication as well. If you don't need it, leave it out. <coughs> so, what kind of databases um, do we use for reviews? Well, there's quite a few we have access to here um, in Trinity. Uh, these are what we call bibliographic, so you get the kind of the publication information from them, okay? So we have multidisciplinary databases like Scopus and the Web of Science. Um, we have our core health databases that we always search, that's Medline, Embase, and Synel. So those will always be searched, and then any combination of what's around here. So the good multidisciplinary ones, and we have also, we can search for systematic reviews. So the CDSR is Cochrane Database Systematic Reviews. There is the database of abstracts and review, reviews of effectiveness. You can also have the economic evaluations. And then depending on what area you're in, if you're doing a kind of psychology, psychiatry type review, you might go to Psych Info. And then we also have ones for social sciences and education, all that kind of stuff. And if you're looking for trials as well, RCTs, that kind of thing, you can try central or clinicaltrials.gov. The World Health Organization has a trials registry as well. 
But again, you don't need to know all this. Just be aware it's out there. And if you need help, come and see an information specialist. Now, interesting enough, this is a survey of systematic reviews. And they were trying to determine where most of the studies in the final review came from. Okay. And as you can see, Medline is far outstrips all of them. Now, this is actually quite biased as well, because a lot of the um, initial searching and the people that were involved in kind of establishing this kind of searching for systematic reviews, they did a lot of work in Medline, and they published a lot of information around Medline, and hence a lot of people went in and started using Medline and taking subscriptions. Embase is actually a better database, okay? And you can see it's the second in the list here. I would actually put it at number one. Um, Sinal, third, Web of Science, and then Info. So that's kind of a hierarchy of the frequency of the use or where these results are coming from. So they're kind of relevant to all databases. So again, Medline, Embase, and Sinal for your core, Web of Science, and depending what else you're using after that. Um, social sciences, they also have their own list of things that they can use as well. Or a search of one database alone is not considered adequate, so we always cast a net wide. So relying solely on database search, even if several databases are searched, is also considered inadequate. To minimize bias during the information retrieval phase, search multiple databases and incorporate alternate strategies, citation, tracking, ray literature, sources, all that kind of stuff to complement the search. So even when you do your search and you've got all that, it's not kind of the end of the story. Sometimes what I do, especially in EndNote, is I will try and see, if we're doing a review, where are most of the articles coming from, which journal, okay, and then I will actually go in and search that journal itself, so it's what we call hand searching, we can look at the list of reviews of the art, or the, the, bibli the bibliography at the end of the really good articles as well, to see if we're missing stuff, and we can also look at other systematic reviews that have been done, and have a look at the studies that they've used. A search of trial registries, if you're using randomized control trials, um, depending on the review, would also be deemed advisable. So you've got things like Central, that's actually in the Corcoran Library. There's clinical trials at Gov, that's part of PubMed and the National Library of Medicine and the ISRCTN. I think that's available to the World Health Organization website. And again, as I mentioned, additional search can occur in hand searching of key journals and conference proceedings. Also scan the bibliographies. And you might also contact individuals, agencies, and academic institutions. Now, sometimes I find when we go into the trial registries, you may find that a trial has started, but there doesn't seem to be any publication details, so it may not have been published. Sometimes what we'll do in that instance, we'll actually contact, if they've got a contact email address, we'll contact and see if there was any results from that trial, and if we can use them ourselves in our review. Um, I know somebody who tracked down results from a trial by using Twitter, contacted the researcher on Twitter and they got the details in. So there's ways and means. Um, neglecting certain sources may result in reviews being biased. Now, we have this concept of grey literature. I'm not going to get too much into detail, but grey literature just refers to anything that's published outside the traditional journals or book format, okay? And there's various places you can go and have a look. It can be things like our government reports or technical reports or maybe kind of internal reports, that kind of stuff, or maybe even PhDs, that kind of stuff would be considered grey lit. Um, so within Europe, we've got things like Open Grey and Open Door, and that's got kind of government European type information. Google, Google Scholar, I use, well, Google Scholar, I use quite intensively as well. So I can do Google Scholar searches. I can make them systematic and tailor them to your needs. You can also look for conference proceedings. Now, a lot of the databases, not, they're not all very comprehensive, but bits of databases have bits and pieces. Scopus is actually quite good. Web of Science is quite good. Embase is quite good as well. But again, the conference is always going to be a bit hit and miss with conference proceedings. And we also have databases for theses and dissertations as well. Now, just to see where Grey Lit tends to come from, uh, Cochrane Library is there, and that's the WHO trial registry. There's clinical trials, Corcoran Specialized Registers, CRD databases, hand searching, that's when you go in and look at the journal yourself, ProQuest, that's theses, conference proceedings. Again, so you see they are coming from various different sources as well, the grey lit. Now, when it comes to writing up uh, what you've done, what your systematic review, there is a prism, it's kind of a guideline to, as to what should be included and what should not be included and the kind of standard you are expected to set. 
And if you need to uh, evaluate your strategy yourself, we have what we call a press, and this provides a set of recommendations concerning the information that should be used by librarians when they are asked to evaluate electronic search strategies. I think those are links there. Um, are, is this being circulated afterwards? Yeah, because there are links and things, so if people want to click on various bits and pieces, okay? Um, now, before I go to questions, I just want to show you, I did mention on the website that we had a guide for doing systematic reviews. I'll just show you where it is. So this is the library homepage. Hold on, it should take me down a sec. Okay, so this is the library homepage. So the library, Trinity College Dublin, TCD, .ie forward slash library. So on this page, and I think mo everyone should have access, under support and training, we have a support for systematic reviews. So there you see, doing a systematic review libguide. Okay. And when you go in, okay, so what is a systematic review, etc. But here, on the left-hand side, you see your research question, choosing where to search, developing a strategy, running recording, managing your research results. So it's all there laid out step by step. And as you see, on the right hand side, we kind of break it down. We've got access to videos and clips. We give advice, we give contact details if you need to contact somebody, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all quite easy. It's quite, all quite laid out for you there quite nicely. Okay. And uh, I think on that note, I shall leave you and I'll hand you over to Nicola who wants to tell you what they do in HSE to help to support you in doing your own systematic so that's Nicola Fay. But just to say, if you or any of your colleagues need any assistance or you want to, you're thinking about maybe doing a bit of research, and even you may not be thinking about doing a systematic review, but any research will, will, will involve some review of the literature at some stage, okay? So by all means, come and approach me, okay? Especially over the summer when it's not so busy and we're not so much, not so much teaching going on. Okay, and uh, I've been involved in quite a lot of reviews and it's kind of work I like to do. So if you do have an idea or if there's something you'd like to see, is it possible or is it viable, by all means, come in and see me. My contact details, you'll find them on the, um, the library homepage. Or if you just want to physically call into the library, I, I don't do work from home on there, <laughs> Monday to Friday. So by all means, call in if you want to see me as well. And we can have a just sit down or Zoom, Teams, whatever works. Okay, listen, uh, best of luck with the competition. Uh, I've had a quick look at the posts. It looked fantastic. I actually like the display as well. It's quite nice. So uh, I wish you all the best of luck and good luck with your research day as well. Before you, you go, uh, David, can I just ask you, you have mentioned sometimes on your scope of review that you might have too few articles that you give a couple of advice. Is there, is, can you go the other way where you actually have too many articles you, you can, but uh, that depends. Again, if it's a team effort, um, now we've had quite a large review. I kind of think 10,000 plus, you're looking at a team effort. 10,000 and below articles, maybe a PhD. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe one to 5,000, a single person might do the review. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you're going to have too many. But if you can have too many, but if you have a team, yeah, you can get it done, especially with the covenants. Because that allows you to go in and screen. You could screen maybe a thousand in an hour, just on the title abstract. So yeah, it's, it's quite feasible, and the software makes it easier. But again, if you're doing it as a single person, you may want to consider how much you want to take on. Yeah. Where's Nina? Actually, and just to say, just not systematic, any, any kind of research, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can give assistance, absolutely. yeah. So yeah. Do you, can I just ask you, how did it go with the chat GPT? What did it do? Is that our new way through? No, what, what I found with chat GPT, it didn't give me any specifics, but what it did was it gave me the broad outlines. Okay, this is where we're interested in dementia. And what I thought is you could take those broad outlines and I could feed them into a search and I could identify papers from those broad outlines. And it was just, it was, it was an eye opener to be yeah. fair. And in especially in re relation to certain things as well. I mean, I, I went in to see if early onset and young onset, for instance, were the same thing. <laughs> and, all the, and it said, no, they're not the same thing, but people you do use them in that context, which t totally ruined one of the, 
researchers because we did young onset, we had 800 articles and then we went to early onset and it mushroomed up to 4,000. And it just, and again, you talk about, is a review viable? Those are the questions. That's when we start asking those questions. Okay, 800 look really good. Yeah, we can do this. 4,000 are kind of going, we don't know, okay. I, yeah, um, I, I think there has to be realis realism about that. I mean, strictly when you're doing a systematic review, you're supposed to identify everything. And I don't think that's feasible. And I think you give it the best attempt with the resources and restraints you have kind of thing. I mean, if you've got a big team, you've got all the resources in the world, if you're, you're a Harvard or whatever, yeah, go for it. But I mean, we, we work with what we have. And to be fair, we do, we do it quite well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not even that. It's the quality of the researchers and the questions being posed, which is makes my life so much easier. And one thing I will say, if you are coming to see me, do have don't come in with a kind of a rough idea. Have a kind of a you know a good idea of what you want to do, even maybe at the research proposal stage or that kind of thing. It doesn't have to be fully sketched out, but I, I just need something. The worst thing is trying to clarify what people are thinking. Um, don't be <laughs> And I think with the software and everything we have, it's just making life so much easier. Yeah, well, just to say, I, I when we were doing it, but I didn't realize that this kind of support was available, and we tried to that's, do it on our own. That's why I'm here. Yeah, well, no, I mean, it's good. It's good to hear, and I wish we'd, I wish I'd known about this because uh, there were there were certainly a few. Uh, I'd say our initial attempts were pretty misguided. Uh, until we kind of figured figured it out, and actually one one of my uh, SPRs, I think, is doing a fellowship program in Galway with Evidence Synthesis Ireland, uh, specifically to try and get sort of to, to get some training in this herself. I think that it was, it was just useful. But I think it's a skill set that um, among the NCHDs that would be a really useful thing to have more of around. I mean, I talked a lot about searching because that's what I talk to, and it's not a skill I would expect you have, and it's not a skill anybody expects you to have. What you, it may be a basic minimal level, and then come and see me. It's important that you're able to identify information yourselves, and it's important that you know things like Boolean and operators, so you can go into PubMed, identify those quick and easy articles, but when you want that comprehensive, that really in-depth search, that's when you approach me, okay? Thank you again, David, because I'm sure that was difficult to condense that down into the very short time we gave you, and we appreciate that. But you did a fantastic, a fantastic job. Thank you again. I'm going to hand you over now to Tullamore. Um, I feel a bit like it's the Eurovision here, so... Uh, uh, Nick Lefay, are you are you there with us in Tullamore? Yes, I'm here. Um, I hope you can hear me, and I hope you can see my screen. We can, Nicola, and we hear you loud, loud and clear. Um, thanks very much, Nicola. I'll I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, and thanks very much to David. And I also have a PowerPoint presentation to share, but I just thought I'd start by going into the HSC library website because the majority of the participating sites today will have access uh, to a lot of the resources that David mentioned earlier. Um, and I know David was concentrating mainly on the systematic review process, but I am just going to approach it really from the, the basics and uh, show you how you can even register in the first place. By There's a login register link here on the HSC Library website. There's um, 
a memorandum of understanding in place between the HSC and some of the sites here in Dublin, um, in the Dublin um, Midland Hospital Group. So if you're not a direct employee of the HSC, you can register here under Section 38 and Partners. So quite a lot of the resources that I'll mention in my PowerPoint when I get to that stage are also available to all staff within the group um, because sometimes that can create a little bit of a barrier for people and they are frustrated if they're trying to access resources remotely not on the hospital site and they wonder why can't I get access to this but the good news is that you can register, you can get uh, what's called an open Athens username and password, and you will be able to access remotely uh, to a lot of the full text articles, a lot of full text content, and also to the databases like the ones that David mentioned there earlier that are used in the systematic review process. Um, also on the help site, uh, on our website, we've also got how-to guides, quite similar to what they have in, in, in TCD. Um, and lots of help there. So um, I'm just going to um, leave you to investigate that um, for yourself. But uh, before I leave the site, I also just want to, uh, in case I don't get back into it later for any connectivity reasons, is I just want to show you that we also have an evidence service within the HSC, and uh, you can actually put in uh, an evidence search request here and this kind of gives a brief outline of um, the resource, the resources available through that evidence search service. And we have four levels of evidence that um, is available through the service. So there's a quick literature search, um, then there's a standard literature search, and we have then more comprehensive and um, searches which would be the kind of more complex search. Um, and then also we provide evidence summaries as well. So again, it all depends on when you fill in the form, how that is effectively triaged to the team within the evidence service. And this is part of Health Library Ireland um, in its endeavors to make uh, resources available across the HSC to, um, in a very accessible way to staff because we've tried over the last number of years in particular to make the service um, as accessible remotely as possible and also to reduce those barriers that are there that um, are frustrating for staff in such a small country with a very small population it's just so complex for a lot of staff to figure out how they can actually access evidence-based resources so i had a quick look actually just in advance of today and um you know i'm happy to share with you that you know all the resources more or less that david has covered are available to staff and also resources such as bmj best practice um, which is available to all staff and citizens in the country entirely on the island of Ireland. So the HSC is facilitating that resource as well, um, access. So, so it just means that you don't even have to be on a HSC site to register. You can access it straight away. And that's also just trying to break down those barriers and make evidence uh, available to clinicians wherever they are. Uh, regardless of, you know, whether they're on-site or off-site. So um, I'm not going to go through uh, every aspect of the website there. I'll let you investigate that for yourselves, but there's a lot of free resources there as well. So um, stop sharing that. And I will just go into my PowerPoint. Um, and I'm going to, I probably won't speak for as long as David because he has covered um, quite a lot of the, the research process um, from the systematic review point of view. But um, here um, I'm based in Tullamore. Um, I'm part of Health Library Ireland. So our, um, I guess our user base would be slightly different to the user base maybe David has being a, an academic librarian uh, based there in St. James's. Um, so we would see quite a bring a lot of staff through the training process um, as well, just to get them started on 
uh, the, the literature and introducing them to the different aspects. So as David described, our, our research roadmap looks like this, developing the research question, looking at the PICO, um, and trying to identify different sources of information that are available, and then how to document research and why it's important. Um, so we have online training courses uh, through a calendar, and the calendar is on our website, and people can um, sign up for these courses if they need some help just getting started themselves. Um, these are the steps to searching systematically, developing the research question, um, the information sources, uh, as David pointed out, there are a bank there of resources that are used and advised in the, in the process. And we have lots of information also. People still love to go back to books and have a look at research books in the, in the library just on the process and how to do your research project and then selecting the different services. So I'm going to probably just fly through a lot of these slides because David has covered the, 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 the question and how to be specific in your approach. So we often meet with staff um, when they are approaching um, the, the process. Again, we're not clinicians ourselves, so we always like to work uh, with the individual. There's a lot of back and forth in, in taking the topic and turning it into a clinical question because it can be quite overwhelming, the amount of information that is out there, and it's just putting it into um, creating the, the, the PICO um, from the topic, turning it into a question. So this, for example, is just one that um, we've had a couple of um, examples in the past that I've just drawn on. One was uh, that somebody just had an idea about preventing burnout in doctors. Um, so that's also just very generic. If you put that into a federated search engine like we have in the library, uh, it would just bring up so many results and it would almost be Google-like the, the number of responses. Whereas we turn that into a question by uh, looking at something much more precise and that gives us the option to break it down into uh, a PICO. Um, the other example we have there is, is around victim of domestic violence. And we can also just look at that question, that topic, and create um, a question from it by looking at what screening tools are available. So here we need to know what our question is. Will I put a patch on a damaged eye? We need to decide, is that an intervention? What's the exposure? What are the experiences, feelings, and barriers and challenges? So we would choose that if somebody came to us as an intervention and start the search from there with that in mind. So I'm just going to go through these slides here quickly because David has covered most of this already, but he described the PICO. Uh, we also have other acronyms that are out there that you might have heard before. Um, so the PICO is usually used in terms of an intervention, but if you are looking at more uh, uh, qualitative research, you would use the SPIDER um, approach. So to give an example, uh, this is our PICO. Uh, no need to go into this, David described it earlier, but this will be an example of what the SPIDER framework would look like. So just an example, uh, we, we take our sample population, um, the S is for adolescents and parents in this case. Uh, what is the interest? Um, we're looking at antenatal education. You need to look at what your study design is. And ours is going to be a survey that we would use. And what would the evaluation be? So um, we would like to see what the desired effect is. And from our question and our search, we would like to see more confidence in parenting skills. Um, then we look at the different research types. And in this case, it would be a mixed method uh, research type. So again, just 
these are very useful tools in developing our question, our inclusion and exclusion criteria and our literature for our literature search. On our website as well, we have um, some sample templates that people can download and use to use um, for their search planning form. Uh, so again, that just helps to document, you know, what you're doing. Uh, so again, for the therapy or the intervention, you need what, to know what your, what your question is going to be. Um, and there are various filters that you can use when searching the literature to, to narrow down your focus and get it to that, that point. Um, I really like this um, pyramid of ev evidence because it just shows the quality of the study types that are available. Um, and it just, in this infographic here, it just shows um, how random it can be if you're starting off uh, thinking about what are the different types of research uh, to, to look at or the study types to use. And this will just focus your mind on uh, what is the, 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 the pyramid, of, pyramid of evidence, um, what, what is the most appropriate research uh, that you can access. So if you look at say case series or case reports, that might be at the bottom of the, the pyramid there, that might be just based on one study. And I'm just thinking straight off of say BMJ case reports, which we have quite a number of staff um, in the HSC that uh, their, their first adventure in publishing is in something like BMJ case reports because they come across an interesting topic or an interesting case. And it's a, it's a nice way to go about publishing, uh, putting up your findings because it guides you through the actual reporting structure. And, you know, it's, it's um, a nice collaborative piece that you can also work on with colleagues and uh, in the multidisciplinary team. And it's a very rigorous publishing um, process as well and it could take a number of months but it might only be maybe one case that you're reporting on whereas if you take it right up to a systematic review you're looking at summaries of uh, systematic reviews that are there um, that are much more rigorous so the higher up the pyramid you go the, the more rigorous the evidence is going to be. So these are just the types of studies. Um, David described the systematic review earlier, um, but we also have RCTs, which are very high level of the uh, of review as well. Uh, we have cohort studies, which measure um, the cause of disease when you have exposure that's been studied. Uh, then you have case control studies. So these are used when you have a controlled group. Um, with or without a, a specific characteristic. And then you have a more general case report or case series, which might just um, have just a, a single or uh, a series of patients. So that can be quite, um, you know, just a small review. There's a, a, a very, um, a very well advanced and interesting um, service and lots and lots that you can find as well on the level of evidence by going to um, the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine, which is located in Oxford. And they have I just included a link there. They have uh, published levels of evidence. Um, they also have evidence summaries and really great links there if you want to explore further information about the different levels of evidence for searching. So I'm just going to um, go through uh, this slide, I'm going to pass, we've gone through the PICO with David already. And um, this was just an example that we used recently in some training that we're providing around uh, just system, systematic searching and what the best study types available to look at this particular question. And the question was about uh, a, an artist in Korea uh, one of our librarians is uh, very um, passionate about Korean music. So she used this as an example, um, and it was to do with the damaged eye. So 
um, what the best what would the best uh, study type be to review uh, this question and I think it's safe to say that a systematic review rather than an RCT would be uh, would be the, the type of study that you would look at so this just uh, brings in the inclusion and the exclusion criteria um, and what you would want to include in the study is the, the patients that are included there on the left. Um, the intervention would be the patch and the comparison would be no patch at all. And then the outcome would be the measurement of the symptoms and healing before and after. And they, you would look at different studies, systematic reviews and RCTs. So really, um, when you're looking at research, the choice of database or the informa information resources that you're looking at would depend on what kind of time you have available and what resources you have access to, um, the type of information you require, uh, what you need the information for, and your own area of expertise. So this is also really why you should reach out and, and uh, link in with your local librarian because they can save you so much time in just giving you access to some training tips on, in the first instance, uh, even just a scoping search on how to help you to save time with some of the, of the, the tips and uh, the expertise that we have as, as librarians to help you with your search. So um, David touched on most of these earlier, but just in the published literature, there are bibliographic databases that are available, such as Embase, uh, such as Medline. Uh, Medline can be available through PubMed, available through the Ovid platform, the EBSCO platform. So there are different platforms that are available and they would all have different nuances there that a librarian can help you with in terms of the, the, the tools that they use that might be unique to that particular database. So we can help you with that. There's also uh, uh, published literature available in the journals. And again, um, I often see uh, here, even for Journal Club in the hospital where I'm based, there could be just so much frustration um, around the access to individual journal subscriptions. And uh, sometimes the doctors in particular would be so busy when they're when they're moving around to all the different hospital sites in their training that they just might forget to call into the library contact the library and say you know I just need a bit of help in, in accessing these journals how do I access them off-site um, and often people are just relying on maybe open access journals or there might be a particular article that they're interested in and they don't realize that the library is there to assist them to actually get access to that article um, and they might just find that there's a paywall but they haven't registered fully or their registration hasn't uh, fully um, panned out for them or they don't know how to retrieve their username and password and they just rely instead on maybe you know less less rigorous uh, data to support whatever research they're, they're doing. So it's really important that you reach out to the library in the first instance before you, you, you embark on any level of, of research. Um, we also have books available and um, the, the, the sources here we have within the library service in the HSC, we have an interlibrary loan cooperative. So uh, if once you're a member of the library, you can request a book that's available uh, in any site within the HSC. Um, so that's also a really good use of sharing our resources. There's the grey literature is a little bit harder to find, a little bit longer to search. And again, this is where your um, librarian can really be beneficial uh, to you um, to help you to get through the, the information and the, the resources that are that little bit more difficult to source. Um, social media has become a really good source as well of sharing and information. Again, just be mindful of the quality of that uh, research that's being shared. But it's also um, a really good 
location now as well to get involved in, in studies and share and collaborate with colleagues. It's also a nice way to reach out if you are thinking of uh, carrying out a survey or doing a questionnaire that you can reach out and contact people that way as well through social media, all with the caveat of, you know, the usual <laughs> careful, um, you know, how you go about it. So this is just um, a quick review of all the different resources that are available. And I probably should mention at this point as well, just back to um, the Cochrane Library. David mentioned it earlier, just in case you missed it. The Cochrane Library, we're very fortunate in Ireland that the Health Research Board um, has arranged for a subscription to the Cochrane Library of Systematic Reviews. And they're available, uh, that, that resource, the Cochrane Library is available to everybody in Ireland, on the island of Ireland, um, like the BMJ Best Practice. Um, so that, that is a, a very good source as well. Just, to bear, just it is a database of systematic reviews. Um, it, it, you won't be searching. Uh, you can search Cochrane, but it has as well. Maybe it, it's got great guides on how to, to use it. Uh, but again, we would, we would suggest that you contact your local library and, and the services of the, your li local librarian if you need further help in searching the Cochrane Library. The other, the other just quick point um, as well is I know most of the sites um, in the Dublin um, Midlands Hospital Group have access to point of care tools such as up to date, um, clinical key, BMJ best practice, and you will find links within those resources um, to the evidence. And again, this can be really useful where you're looking at summaries of evidence and you want to actually look at the study that supports that evidence summary or supports that, that quick summary um, that's been put together by the editors um, in, you know, that are expert in the different specialties. Um, and again, that's where you can contact your library if you're finding it difficult to get access to particular studies or research that's available. But also what I find very um, helpful is that it's a nice one-stop shop for a lot of the clinical guidelines that are there, you know, particularly the um, European and international guidelines. Um, and they will actually show when they were last updated and reviewed. So just to bear that in mind as well. Um, there are some links in to some of the great literature sources that we have available, and uh, I'm just also going to mention very briefly there Lenis, which is the Irish repository for all healthcare literature. Um, I'm not going to open any links because just um, for now, just with the time constraints, what Lenis is 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 a great resource as well for anything that is Irish based. So it draws together all the, the research that's available in Ireland, also from the Department of Health, all the former health board areas. Um, it has, it, it, it's growing all the time. It has also lots of open access content that's available. So if you have something that you want to share, um, you can contact us and we can help you with sharing it on Lenis as, um, as, a, as a good place where it can, be available. The content there is available to download as PDFs. Um, so it's 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 a it's a repository for all published publications and healthcare related uh, literature. So um, just touched on this briefly. Um, just social media. It's it is again helpful to um, give you another access route to. Um, information and research that's out there, but just again to bear in mind that the quality of that research and the copyright, um, which also can be very difficult if you get into trouble with infringement. Um, so I'm not going to go through the search strategy because I think David already went through that quite in great detail earlier, but this is just an example that I have in my uh, slides of our question earlier around helping doctors who have burnout. 
and uh, we've divided it into our PICO here, just to break down the question. And as David mentioned, we have a mixture of subject headings and then we have keywords. Again, with the vast amount of research that's out there, we would always um, ask you, know, you to consider using a title abstract um, in the keyword search, um, just to kind of minimize the number of results that you get back and try and find more um, relevant information. Um, so these are just examples of some of the, the I, I guess, the definitions around knowing the difference between keywords and subject headings. So the subject headings is the controlled vocabulary that is used um, in the various databases. Um, and they will differ from one database uh, to another. So they're described in PubMed um, as mesh headings and in Embase as M3 headings. So they, they, they will vary from one database to another. And that's where your librarian or your information specialist can help you just with the, um, you know, how to actually choose the correct subject headings, how to navigate um, the language around keyword searching and subject headings and when to use them. Um, so these I'll just go through this quickly here again. Um, the mesh is in Medline and PubMed. Um, CINAHL um, is mainly the nursing and allied health literature. And in PsychInfo, uh, the thesaurus is the psychological index terms. And in Cochrane, Cochrane also uses mesh as well. But again, little tips um, for available for using the, the application when you actually go to search will be available um, with local library staff. Um, so I'm going to skip that slide there. Um, and I like this um, just breakdown of the PICO question. And again, as David described earlier, when you're using your, your PICO and thinking about your PICO, um, you need to use a combination of the mesh headings with your keywords. So my mesh heading in this case um, for a junior doctor would be the MH here. That's a, an acronym just for, for the mesh. And then these would be the keywords to describe um, the different names associated with NCHDs. And I remember when I joined the, the HSE some years ago now, I remember I didn't even know what an NCHD was for about three weeks until I had the courage to say, you know, what, what does that stand for? Because again, you know, we, we can use a lot of jargon and we can use a lot of acronyms and um, sometimes it's not always obvious, you know, it, it, so we just need to bear in mind that this is an international literature that we're considering international spelling can vary from one country to another. So we need to, to keep that in mind as well when we're, when we're approaching our, our, our searching and our research. And again, these are the, the Boolean operators. Uh, your librarian can help you with these. There are lots of really nice tutorials as well that are available, even on YouTube, a little short five minute uh, tutorials just to explain. And it's amazing how people are in a panic and they need to find some research, uh, find something for their journal club or uh, find something um, for a, a, an abstract that they have to prepare. Uh, they're thinking about a poster, they just, throw uh, a question uh, all together into a search engine and they wonder why they don't get the results that they need. So there is a systematic approach to using Boolean operators to manage your search, divide it out quite systematically into the different concepts and then use the operators or and and to um, get the results that are relevant to what your, your question is. So just to, I, I guess, a quick um, explanation would be you use or if you want to search like terms or synonyms. And then once you have your all your concepts broken out, you can use and to connect them together. And that will give you um, hopefully the answer to your question. So uh, don't be put off by the number of results that you will see when you start your search because 
the broader you search, the less likely you are to miss anything important in the literature. Um, so, so that's just very important that you use those Boolean operators and use a combination of keywords and mesh terms. And, and even though the librarian can help you with your searching and do the search for you, you know, you as the clinician will be the one that has the, the idea. And usually it's something that you're interested in, passionate about. So you need to sit down with somebody when you're planning your search and, you know, map it all out. Don't get carried away by delving straight into the, the databases. Use a planning technique first to just map out what you actually want to do. And then, you know, your, your chances of finding a more appropriate set of results to review and to screen uh, will be much more fruitful and less frustrating in searching. So little link to a YouTube video there on Boolean operators, and I'm not going to get into too much detail about the search syntax, but David gave really good examples there earlier in his presentation about when to use truncation, uh, the proximity operators, the different wildcards. But again, just to bear in mind that there will be a little bit of difference between the different databases in how these are actually applied in, in practice. Um, so each database will have its own search syntax. So PubMed only recently started using proximity operators and um, they've got a new help section on their website if you want to have a look at how they're, 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 they're used. But again, your librarian will help you with that level of detail. In the Ovid platform, they use the ADJ adjacent instead of the N or the W. And in Cochrane, they use next or near, and Web of Science uses near. So it will, it will vary um, from one platform to another. So again, just by spending some time approaching this, learning about the different nuances between the different databases will ha really help you in your search. Um, we had the PICO earlier, and these are just some of the, the searches. So again, there's a systematic review libguide there that I've just included as a link. Um, and then really important from the get-go is that you document your search because you will probably go off into different resources depending on whether it's a database search. Um, the good practice is to search multiple databases so you're not missing any of the, the available relevant content that's there. Um, but use a tool um, as you go and save your searches. And a lot of the searches, you can actually save them and go back and modify them now online using um, cloud-based technology. Um, the resources that we subscribe to in the HSC all have functionality within them to save your searching, uh, your searches to a folder within that particular database. So really important that you do that as soon as you start your search process. Otherwise, uh, you'll be really frustrated if you try to save to a local device um, to a local drive and you can't retrieve what you've done afterwards. So um, very, very important that you document your search um, from the, from the get-go and that you use a tool to manage your references um, for your review. Now EndNote is, there is a free EndNote um, version available. Uh, most of the databases will export um, the results to EndNote in what's called a RIS file, a .ris file. Um, and again, your library staff will help you with that process. Um, and there, uh, David touched on the screening tools uh, available. So again, when you go to put your research together, you will need to document your search. Um, obviously, the librarian will be enlisted and probably do your search for you if it's something like a systematic review. But if you are doing um, just a basic, if you're just searching systematically but not actually searching, uh, at, then you would just need to be mindful of documenting your search so that you can 
uh, replicate it at a later stage and, and show how you went about doing that process. So there is a, a checklist. I've just put a, a link there to it. It's called uh, Prisma and uh, it just gives you a checklist for searching. So again, I think there are about 16, uh, 16 yeah, uh, steps here that you can just uh, review and just ensure it's very, very useful to use the Prisma checklist um, when you're documenting uh, your search and managing your results. Um, so again, just that's a quick review of what I said earlier and uh, the Prisma workflow, lots of information on the Prisma website. They've got a lovely flow diagram that just describes the, the process. Um, again, uh, when, you're, when you're managing and screening your results, um, a lot of the databases now as well have got nice um, citation uh, tips and, and tools that you can use within the databases um, to, to manage your results, whether you want to use the Harvard referencing style or um, if there's a particular style that you've been asked to use by um, your uh, supervisor or whoever is helping you with your, your research. Um, again, you can, you can use that um, when you're managing and screening your results. So again, contact your library um, for, for help with, with the, the managing um, system. On our website, uh, on the HSE Library website as well, um, we have links to how to reference and manage um, your, your results. We have right and site within the HSE, but it has been problematic uh, just with the recent cyber attack in installing right and site. Um, so, most of our users are now using just EndNote online and um, they're, they, they don't use the right and sight function on their, on their own device because it just has been problematic. Um, so just to bear that in mind as well, the EndNote um, online version should be sufficient for your needs. Uh, so again, you can uh, create your own uh, reference database and create a bibliography of your of your results uh, by using a reference management management system. And again, in the HSC, we have some uh, online courses that we provide. I see that uh, TCD also has some workshops available um, regularly running on on how to use EndNote um, and also how to move on to the next phase, which is screening. Now, we, we used to have a subscription in the HSE to Providence, and it is subscription-based. We don't actually have a subscription now, but we do use uh, Rayan instead for screening as a screening tool. Um, so again, you just use this for your inclusion, exclusion criteria. This is just an example of what you would include and what you would exclude in your, your PICO, which is really useful when you document this from the beginning, by the time you get to the screening stage, it really helps that your um, inclusion and exclusion criteria is already well bedded down in your own mind, um, because then you can just exclude the, the studies that you don't need uh, at, that, at that point. Um, so that's just, um, a very quick run through um, the, the service that's available through the HSC. Um, if you need to contact me, I, my email is there. I'm happy to um, assist you in maybe directing you to who might be the appropriate uh, librarian to contact in your area, uh, in your hospital site um, for further help. We have um, lots of um, signposting there on the HSC library site. So I would encourage you to um, have a look at, at registering for the resources that you have access to. Um, as I mentioned, there is a memorandum of understanding between the HSC and um, the, the different hospital sites to provide access to the resources that you know, we mentioned earlier, both David and I, that you have access to and that you will need as part of uh, your research process. So I'm happy to stop there. Um, if 
there are any questions you'd like to ask or we're just waiting on the mic nicola thanks very much nicola can you hear me i can hear you yes i can't see you but i can hear you <laughs> Oh, I'm happy to say after all this time, I what it stands for. Yes, thank you. But, you know, it is it can be quite daunting. Um, like most librarians, um, you know, we, we don't specifically come from a healthcare background. So um, it, it's, it's just assumed that people come in from maybe a previous life in another organization that, uh, you know, everybody assumes, oh, you know, you know what these acronyms stand for. But uh, no, it didn't take too long. No, thank you. Idea that there was so much of a resource available through the HSC, absolutely no clue. Um, and when when you, um, I was happened to be in the Botanic Gardens at the weekend, and I saw that they had this citizen science um, program running. You know, where people could look at various flowers and bees and things like that, and get it recorded into a, a central database. Do you think is there a time coming when we should be offering patients and um, their caregivers some understanding of how to search the literature well? maybe to save them from the troubles of Dr. Google. <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, and that's really good. I mean, I think I think we will, we, we have run some programs, you know, particularly I'm based here in the Midlands and we, we have reached out to the public libraries and offered assistance to the public libraries, you know, particularly around say BMJ best practice. Uh, we're trying really hard to heavily promote that as a resource at the moment because within BMJ Best Practice, there is um, like a patient information area within that. And anybody in on, on the island of Ireland can actually download that app now free of charge. It's paid for by the HSE, um, but at least the information that is there that is in layman's terms in the, those patient information leaflets is so useful in helping the patient to understand their their condition and that is available to download now obviously it is also uh, when people have access to that they will also have access to the, the information that the clinicians will have within that database but it is an effort to uh, provide equitable access to the evidence base for everybody. Um, so I don't know whether that goes some way to answering your question, um, but by all means, if you have an opportunity to promote uh, BMJ best practice where you are, um, you know, certainly a lot of the GPs, a lot of practice nurses are promoting it um, to patients at the moment. Um, and it's, it's, it has helped to kind of break down that barrier um, and help patients to understand that they can get access to a nice short summary uh, put together by the specialists in that area that will describe their, their condition. Thanks, Nicola. And can I just say how nice it is to have you join us from Tullamore? It definitely does feel like it, the Eurovision. <laughs> Please. Thank you. And thanks, thanks for your time. And sorry, there probably was a little bit of duplication between um, what David uh, had to say today and also um, in my presentation, but I guess at the end of the day, you know, that, that is what we do. Um, that is the service we provide. We're there to assist people with searching. Um, and, you know, so, so please use the service and reach out to us. And, and between both talks, you wonderfully represented the Bolian and I think so reinforced it for us so i think the li your librarian is your best is your best friend for anyone who who's uh, uh going to undertake uh, research uh thanks very much nicola just for anyone who's online so we're 15 minutes behind schedule but so just to factor in uh that but we're going to start with our first uh nchd talk today so we're on to the kind of the main the main event so our first presenter today is uh, uh, from James's Jesse Elliott. Um, so Jesse's well used to this auditorium. So uh, Jesse is going to talk about 
a European multi-centre study comparing neoadjuvant neo chemoradiotherapy versus chemotherapy for the treatment of locally advanced esophageal adenocarcinoma. Thanks, Jesse. There'll be, yeah, we're going to have 10 minutes. I'll give Jesse a nod at nine, I'll sit at the front, and then uh, just questions from the judges then. Okay, great. So um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present here today. One second. Great. So um, for patients with locally advanced esophageal and junctional cancer, we know that neoadjuvant therapy, either with neoadjuvant chemotherapy or chemoradiation, improves overall survival as compared with surgery alone. However, there's currently no gold standard approach. The rationale of chemoradiotherapy is to downstage locally advanced disease and improve local control. But the converse argument is that a radical on block esophagectomy and lymphadenectomy may limit or even negate the added benefit of radiotherapy. And while we have good level one evidence, as shown here, demonstrating the efficacy of both of these treatment strategies as compared with surgery alone. There's currently no head-to-head -head trial that has been published to inform our decision-making. Ongoing and recently completed randomized controlled trials, including NeoAgis from St. James's, ESOPEC uh, and the RACE trial aim to address this question and are expected to report in the coming years. So at present, we rely on previous trials and on making indirect comparisons. And from the data, there per perhaps is some suggestion that post-operative uh, risk may be increased among patients receiving pre-operative radiotherapy. However, comparing trial outcomes, overall survival results appear to be equivalent between the, uh, both approaches. So in the absence of any level one evidence in this area, the present study aimed among patients with locally advanced esophageal and junctional adenocarcinoma to determine the impact of neoadjuvant treatment strategies on perioperative outcomes, recurrence patterns and treatment of recurrence, survival and health related quality of life. So this was an a priori planned secondary analysis of the NSHARE study. NSHARE was an international multi-center study which I set up and conducted across 27 European and North American centers. And this aimed to determine the influence of surveillance strategies on oncological and quality of life outcomes among patients with esophageal cancer and was published last year. For this particular study, we included patients from the Ensure data set who underwent curative intent surgery following neoadjuvant therapy for locally advanced esophageal and junctional adenocarcinoma between 2009 and 2015. The primary outcome measure was overall survival. We also assessed a number of secondary outcome measures, including disease specific and disease free survival, recurrence patterns, health related quality of life. And we defined a number of a priori uh, subgroup analyses. The study was approved by the St. James and Tala Research Ethics Committee and was registered on clinicaltrials.gov. So from the complete NSHARE study database containing 4,793 patients, 3,284 were treated with neoadjuvant therapy for locally advanced disease, of whom about two thirds had adenocarcinoma. And the most common neoadjuvant protocols that were used were ECF um, for the chemotherapy group and CROSS for the chemoradiation group. Following neoadjuvant therapy, 2,211 patients proceeded to undergo esophagectomy, and this represents our final study cohort. So on to some of our results. Um, so firstly, in terms of the uh, clinical T and end stage, the two groups were relatively well matched. Although it should be noted that patients in the, excuse me, in the chemoradiation arm were slightly younger and were more likely to undergo a minimally invasive um, resection. 
For the rest of the presentation, all key outcome pr uh, parameters will be adjusted for, um, using multivariable analyses um, to adjust for these uh, differences at baseline. In terms of the pathologic response, we found that following completion of neoadjuvant therapy, patients who underwent chemo radiotherapy had significantly more tumor and nodal downstaging and were more likely to achieve a pathologic complete response and an OR0 resection. So first we wanted to look at post-operative outcomes. Um, we found that on multivari multivariable analysis, patients who underwent neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy had an increased risk of post-operative morbidity, an increased risk of anastomotic leak, and an increased risk of in-hospital mortality as compared with patients treated with chemotherapy. In summary, chemo radiotherapy was associated with increased post-operative complications and mortality among, uh, as compared with chemotherapy in this cohort. The next thing we wanted to look at was recurrence patterns. So looking uh, at a median uh, follow-up of uh, five years, we found that the overall recurrence rate was equivalent between the two groups. Looking at our recurrence patterns, the absolute probability of a lo uh, local recurrence was greater following chemotherapy. Um, however, there was no difference in the local recurrence free survival time between the groups. Looking at distant recurrence, we found that the absolute risk of distant recurrence was also similar between both approaches, but the distant recurrence free survival time was greater following neoadjuvant chemotherapy as compared with chemo radiation. In summary, um, patients experienced more local recurrences after chemotherapy, but experienced a more rapid distant recurrence after chemo radiotherapy. The next big question was whether these differences in histopathologic responses um, and recurrence patterns would translate into a difference in survival outcomes. We found no significant difference in disease-free, disease-specific or overall survival on univariable or multivariable analysis between the two groups. To summarise, among all patients, there was no difference in survival outcome between chemoradiotherapy and chemotherapy. So given the equivalent overall survival outcomes across the entire cohort, we wanted to determine whether we could provide any data that would support personalization of a treatment strategy for a given patient. Importantly, we found that older patients and patients with a greater ASA grade experienced improved overall survival following administration of neoadjuvant chemotherapy as compared with chemo radiation. We also found that patients who underwent a minimally invasive esophagectomy experienced better overall survival following neoadjuvant chemotherapy as compared with chemo radiation. And looking at the pathological characteristics, we found that patients who had a more locally advanced T stage uh, experienced improved overall survival with chemotherapy as compared with chemo radiation. And importantly, when an OR0 resection could be achieved, survival was significantly improved after chemotherapy as, com as compared with chemo radiation. And furthermore, the presence of a pathological complete response following chemotherapy was associated with a 2.6 fold improvement in overall survival as compared with a pathological complete response after chemo radiation. So lastly, we wanted to look at the impact of the neoadjuvant regimen on patients' health related quality of life in survivorship. Looking at the spider diagrams, you can see that functional and symptom scores were similar following chemotherapy and chemo radiation with no clinically significant differences in health-related quality of life observed between the two groups. So in summary, we found that among patients with locally advanced esophageal and junctional adenocarcinoma treated with curative intent, chemoradiotherapy was associated with increased perioperative morbidity and mortality as compared with chemoradiation. Patients who underwent neoadjuvant chemotherapy had an increased absolute probability of uh, local recurrence but distant recurrence free survival time was also increased in this group. We found that survival outcomes were equivalent between the two different treatment strategies, but that chemotherapy was associated with an overall survival benefit in some subgroups. And importantly, our study highlights the um, uh, prognostic importance of an OR0 resection uh, and a pathological complete response following neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, which is associated with significantly improved overall survival and there was no difference in quality of life between the two treatment approaches. So in conclusion from this study, um, which represents the largest uh, study uh, of this nature, looking at chemotherapy versus chemoradiation for esophageal adenocarcinoma to date, 
We would suggest a tailored patient specific approach to neoadjuvant therapy planning. We would suggest that where resection margins are threatened, chemoradiotherapy may facilitate an or zero resection and reduce the risk of local recurrence, but that this does occur at the expense of increased perioperative risk. Um, we would suggest that where or zero resection appears feasible without additional local control, chemotherapy may have some advantages in terms of control of micrometastatic disease. So I would like to thank all the collaborators who took part in this study, um, and I'd now like to welcome any questions or comments. Um, I think we started working on this in 2018, um, so that was when we first designed the original NSHARE study and we designed it with a three year follow up for all the patients. So. And is there anything that you can do to mitigate that increased perioperative risk, you know, and that, that, that you think would, would, would bring the uh, chemo radio option back into play for a, a wider group or is it dead in the water except for the very specific group you mentioned? Yeah, I think, um, I suppose patient selection is really important. And um, I think in, in James's, we have a very good um, kind of history of um, looking at patient selection in the neoadjuvant chemo radiation setting and risk factors for, uh, say, reductions in uh, pulmonary function, for example, after neoadjuvant therapy. So there's probably some um, factors that could be used to protect those patients at risk of an adverse perioperative outcome following new adjuvant chemo radiation. We've studied that before, showing you know patients who are smokers, obviously patients who have very large bulky tumors, are at increased risk of say a reduction in their pulmonary function following new adjuvant chemo radiation. Um, so Dr. Cunningham is here. Um, so. Uh, she, she may comment on some of the kind of newer techniques for targeting of radiotherapy because the status from 2009 and 2000 to 2015 and it's possible that um, that that may reduce the the hit to surrounding tissues and uh, improve perioperative outcomes so and would it make a difference do you think to the anastomotic leak issue particularly is that what you had in mind well i guess the issue with junctional adenocarcinoma is that um, the proximal stomach is getting a radiotherapy hit um, and we suspect that that has an impact on the microvascular circulation in the gastric fundus, which we're going to use for our anastomosis. So, um, you know, limiting the radiotherapy dose to the proximal stomach is very important um, in, in theory in reducing anastomotic leak rates. Um, but that, that's kind of the best hypothesis that we have for, for why that occurs. Lastly, can I ask you, it's very hard to walk away from something that's of current practice. So how, you know, would you, would you plan to disseminate the results and what would be your follow on study if you had a million euros? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's a few. Um, first of all, I'd say that both of these um, neoadjuvant protocols are currently standard practice. Um, and for squamous cell carcinoma, there's no doubt that chemo radiation is very effective. Um, so I think moving forward, like this data is, is a stopgap to the RCT data that will come out in the next few years. Um, and I think that might help us to select the patients who benefit from one treatment approach or another. There's a few big randomized controlled trials, including Neoagis from, led from St. James's, which we'll publish in the next few years. And I think that will kind of further inform the debate. So. Jesse. Thanks very much. That was a very interesting talk. Um, the question, I, I just have one and it comes with the caveat that I'm not an expert in the area by any means. So, but I am more familiar with the, the recent studies on uh, pre prehabilitation for this cohort of um, patients and, and exercise. So uh, in terms of modifiable risk factors and selecting the best treatment for patients, is there anything that patients can do before I suppose they go for their treatments or their surgery in terms of um, rehabilitation modifying those risk factors before they come for, um, for their treatment. Would that have any effect on the outcome here? Yeah, so there's been lots of really good evidence um, in the kind of prehabilitation field for esophageal cancer recently. And we know that it has a significant impact in reducing post-operative pulmonary complications. Um, and, you know, you're right, like some of um, this data was probably before um, you know, aggressive prehabilitation became routine um, in uh, esophageal cancer. 
Um, and I think we don't really know um, whether that impacts the differential effects of the neoadjuvant protocol on post-operative complications. Um, it's certainly something that has the potential to very significantly improve particularly pulmonary complications among patients after esophagectomy. So it'll be interesting to see the um, newer trial data as it comes out. Just in the interest of fairness, Jesse, I know the answer to this, but I'm just going to ask everyone the same question. What was mm -hmm. your personal involvement in this project? Um, yeah, so I um, designed this study and I uh, recruited the centres across uh, Europe and North America. So we had 27 centres who were recruited to take part. And then we had uh, individual investigators at each centre who collected their data um, and submitted the data to um, me. And then um, I analysed the data in conjunction with them. Um, a statistician who consulted on some of our multivariable analyses um, and have written up the paper so, with Professor Reynolds' help. <laughs> and your timing is impeccable as always. Uh, just our second uh, question was from Jerry Hughes. Uh, Jerry is uh, he works here in the research and innovation uh, department, and it was remiss of me not to introduce him at the at the beginning. All right. So our second uh, presentation comes from uh, Tally University Hospital, and it's Dr. Connor Costigan. And Connor's title of his talk is "Cloud Technology and Capsule Endoscopy: A Single Center User's Experience of Online Video Analysis and Reporting." Thank you, Connor. Um, good evening, everyone. So my name is Connor. I'm one of the gastro registrars in Tala Hospital, and this is an innovation project that we undertook uh, locally on our site. So this is a pill camera for anyone that doesn't know. Um, it is a tiny camera inside an opaque plastic tube, and we use this as an adjunct to diagnose various gastroenterological diseases um, and for disease monitoring as well. So that's just for for um, for size. So the background is over the last couple of years, I think um, with the pandemic, we've seen um, a massive progression in the use of virtual medicine and the use of telemedicine. And we've seen how those things can affect uh, hospital experiences for patients and staff alike. So I think it's very clear that these new IT systems and these new solutions we have can improve healthcare access for patients and improve our experiences as the, as the doctors and staff as well. So capsule endoscopy has been around for about 20 years and um, first uh, described in about 2001 and since then it's become quite a uh, quite a vital tool for gastro investigations it forms a major part of many european and international guidelines for the diagnosis first of all but also the monitoring of many diseases crohn's ulcerative colitis as it has many benefits over uh, traditional diagnostic uses and um, currently at the moment tala is the largest capsule center in europe uh, we do the most numbers, and I know the HSC has recently opened a few more centres, including here in James's uh, last Christmas, last summer, excuse me. However, access is very, very poor uh, still generally across the country. So we lag behind most developed nations in in access to what is essentially a vital diagnostic tool. Um, the literature well describes that delayed access to capsule endoscopy uh, increases bed days in hospitals. It increases representations to EDs. It increases patient morbidity and mortality, and it increases skyrockets costs to the healthcare system. So if we had an option that could eliminate some of these problems, what could that do for us? So first of all, um, the project that we've, oh, the slides are in the wrong order, I can't believe that. Um, no, it's fine, excuse me. Uh, so the, uh, so our project is to uh, engage with a one of our colleagues or a drug company to see if we could improve or instigate a new um, system that would improve access uh, to this system in the largest centre in Europe. So we wanted to increase the ease of use and access for our use, increase our efficiency, increase our accuracy and reduce our costs in the healthcare system. And we hope that from the patient's point of view, accessing this, um, we would give them increased access, excuse me, um, safe, efficient uh, testing, reduced waiting times and that it's a very accessible test. So 
currently, as a moment, as I, as I said, this diagnostic tool is very much confined to uh, excuse me, specific centres with expert readers. So as I said, in Tallow, we're the largest centre in Europe, and there are six other centres around Ireland, each of which do about 200 capsules a year, uh, which is the HSE's funding, and we do about 40 a week. So we account for the vast majority of capsules done on the island. Um, the problem is we have very few readers in the hospital and we have very few trainees coming through because there are few readers. Uh, we also diagnose patients or do this procedure on unstable patients, patients with massive occult GI bleeds, ITU patients, frail patients, and of course patients from all over the country. So can the development of the world's first interactive cloud-based capsule platform allow for the safe and timely analysis of videos uh, from virtual position uh, from a network of linked centers. So that's our hospital group here. So the system that we've, in, that we've um, uh, integrated into our hospital at the moment is that the capsule could be administered uh, locally, be that in Tullamore, in Port Leash, uh, here in James's, or I suppose in the future we see it going out into the community. It's anonymized and uploaded to an encrypted cloud-based server, which is run by Medtronic. Um, Myself or some of our team across our expert readers can access this anonymized images. Uh, we can see them um, anywhere from any uh, internet enabled um, computer in the world. We can type up our report and we can send that back to the cloud, which sends it back to the local hospital system and the report can go back to the uh, referring doctor. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the methods we used for this were we, um, we uh, we integrated the system into our capsule database. So we assessed the numbers and demographics of the patients that we used over about a six month period. And we collected user reported um, performance from all of our expert readers in Tala Hospital uh, using an online survey. So some of our outcomes included the procedure success, the upload download success rate, any breaches in encryption or GDPR protocols. Um, and then I suppose how satisfied the reader, reader experience was compared with our normal system of transferring patients from hospitals, waiting on a bed, uploading it on the, the desktops in the, in the hospital. So we've done just over 400 studies as of now, 377 as of last week, uh, seven different expert readers in Tala, and the vast majority of them are small bowel capsules. So again, we're one of two, but by far the largest small bowel capsule um, center in the country. The overall procedure success, so that is the anonymization, the uploading and the, the downloading of the reports on the other end was 100%. So we had no breaches in GDPR, we had no problems uploading or downloading um, reports to, to patients at a distance, which is very reassuring. We had one episode where a Lewis score, which is a scoring system for Crohn's, couldn't be uploaded uh, automatically onto, uh, onto the automated report. Uh, however, that was uh, um, that was rectified with assistance from the company less than 24 hours. And as I said, very importantly, no breaches in GDPR. So we had a look at our experience then of how this in practice works compared to what we used to use. And I think prior to, so prior to the, um, pr pr prior to the use of this system, there was a problem in accessing the computer. So we had uh, no more than you would have an ultrasound machine or you would have a, a CT scanner or something like that. The, capsule images had to be physically read on specified computers. So this created a bottleneck and there were normal computers spread out around the wards and people that uh, use communal areas were had ser severe difficulty in accessing them and therefore that delayed reading time and processing of results to patients. 71% of people felt that it increased the efficiency department for the reasons I've outlined. And I think the remaining people may have been some of our consultant colleagues with special computers in their office. And I think some of the other things that we realized while doing this might, yeah. So some of the other things that we realized while we were doing this was that there were additional benefits as well. So while you know we can read capsules from patients far away, we can get the reports back to them on time. There was also things that we could read them from offsite we could ask for a consult or we could ask for advice from a senior doctor or indeed a clinician in another hospital um, at any hour of the day or night to help us or to get a second opinion on some images. We've also used it to facilitate multi-site conferences as well uh, between hospitals, uh, between practitioners in other locations um, over this secure server. 
So some of the issues we had unfortunately showed that there was a, a problem physically uploading them onto the cloud. We had no admin support. Uh, and then of course, lack of access to the other hospital systems is in Tala, we're not as, um, we're not as online as you guys here are in James's, and um, that's coming soon, but uh, we wouldn't have access to say bloods, referral letters or, or NIMIS imaging. So this is just some of the initial concerns uh, people had at the start, data protection, uh, timeliness, getting it uploaded on time, assigning the readers and then no EPR access if you were offsite. Uh, and then positive features we found that actually most of us had better quality laptops than the HSE uh, computers. So it was a nice little uh, surprise for us. So actually I wonder, we didn't check our diagnostic yield, but it may have gone up. Hybrid working, very, uh, very topical, very popular at the moment, so those of us that those are our friends that don't work in uh, hospital settings, um, but obviously a very attractive thing if we could make it happen. And then the facility, they do have those MDTs to have experts from elsewhere in uh, was something we were all looking forward to. So we noticed that you could read from anywhere at any time. So here's me doing one at the bottom of the seat. Uh, you can get, uh, these are some really experts in Tala. You can, thanks. You can um, get a consult anytime, anywhere. Uh, you can read an emergency capsule, you can drop, in the field and, and do it as soon as possible and you can liaise with some of your colleagues uh, as well as train some of the junior members of my team it's dr oliver castigan at home uh, helping me reading some uh, on the weekend so the cons as we said previously only uploadable from a single desktop and that that was a a, a real bottleneck in uploading them to the secure uh, secure desktop to upload to the secure server but we have um no admin support, as I said, and duplicating them, reading them locally on the system, but also uh, online. And the two systems didn't quite mesh up uh, with our local IT systems. So we had to go back, look at all the shareholders. We had to get the lab involved. We had to get the GDPR, the lawyers. We had to get the IT uh, people involved. And happily, we've managed to rectify most of these problems. And uh, now all of the capsules, if any of you refer a patient for a capsule to Tala, inpatient, outpatient, emergency or otherwise, when they come back to us and drop the belt back, it's automatically uploaded to our encrypted cloud. And myself or one of my one of my colleagues can see it at any time of the day or night. So I completely got rid of that. Where do we see this going in the future? Um, these are our capsule hubs at the moment. As I said, there's uh, seven. We see them feeding into this national capsule uh, database registry and potential for MDTs. And then we see probably more further off in the future that each of the hospital hubs in the major cities will probably have a network of GP practices or community-based nurse specialists who can administer these things and feedback and um, security to have an expert reader. So this can be delivered in the hospital's own, in the patient's own community, excuse me. So to conclude, uh, it's a very innovative uh, way to expand timely and appropriate access to this vital diagnostic tool for patients. We can share expertise, we can share training uh, among physicians to our hospital group and throughout the country, and we can reduce bed pressures, ED attendances, and healthcare costs at the moment. We're seeing it already in Tala. So it's a reliable, secure, and effective capsule analysis platform. And we think that for here in James's or any of the other sites that are um, creating their capsule services uh, in this, this year as it is, uh, we would recommend it. Thank you to all the team and any questions. Thanks very much, Connor. That Hello. was great. Um, tell me, I've got a few different questions. Yeah. Uh, with the anonymization, okay, you couldn't yes. link to other relevant clinical information. So how do you see getting over that problem in the future, given that we don't have a un sort of un universal or national electronic health record? Yeah. So I suppose um, what, what we did get was we, we don't get a name, a date of birth, anything like that. We do get a, a short little vin anonymized vignette. Uh, which comes from it. So I might get that there's a 30-year-old male that has a seven-day history of melina on blood thinners and a family history of Crohn's or something like that. So you, you do get some information to contextualize the study, but there's nothing that could lead back to mm. Connor from Tala. Um, so we haven't actually found that the uh, not having the patient's details while reading is not strictly necessary, I don't think. Mm. Uh, we've found no problems in um, we just send it back to the cloud, I suppose, and, it, and it's reintegrated. Most of them are Tala patients, I suppose, that we do, but uh, we've had no problems in contextualizing the images that you see uh, because we do have that clinical vignette. Mm -hmm. And can I ask you, um, how did you deal with 
it, it, this is a new world for inter-reader, I suppose, variability. Yeah. You know, because people are maybe distracted by the ploughing or the cat or whatever. So, um, yeah. whereas we're used to being in the moment in work. So yes. how, how would you go about credentialing that? And yeah. training for that. Yeah, I think that okay. I think that's very topical. I, sh I should just uh, clarify first of all that I did. Those are altered photos. I don't read. Yeah, that, I, yeah. Know, I know. <laughs> I don't do them at the bottom of the sea either. Uh, that'd be a bit odd. But we knew yeah. that you and the cat weren't really. really <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so no, I think um, I th that that is definitely a problem, isn't it? I suppose. I, I think that's very difficult. I think it's very easy to do in the setting of. I mean, what this is comparable from my point of view is is like Nimus. Okay, that's how I see this going in, in the future as this as this rolls out and it starts to replace endoscopy. So, um, I, I, I think that I think it's very difficult to do that. I think I think the problem at the moment is that we we didn't have any um, reading space in the hospital at all. So actually, what we found is the system as it was was that you had the gastro regs um, up on the, the side of the ward or in the communal uh, endoscopy office uh, trying to read these capsules, which take about an hour. Uh, each uh, with people coming and going and people shouting and screaming and can you do a scope and, and all these things so for us it's actually made things a lot more peaceful we haven't in instituted at the moment uh, that you might do a list from home uh, but I think that was the idea that some of our nurse specialists might consider doing but I think it would it would require some to say authorization or certification from the hospital as a, as a clinical space yeah I'm not sure yeah. that's interesting yeah. But it worked okay for the radiologists in general. But they seem to get, they know, seem seem to get on to very well. <laughs> so presumably it's not beyond us. No. Very. Connor, thanks very much. Another interesting talk. Um, I may have missed it as you went along there, but yeah. uh, any feedback from the patients at all? Did they find any difference or any kind of uh, advantages or um, what was their experience of it? Yeah, well? no, I, I think the patients don't see any difference at all. Um, they, they still collect and deliver back the, the memory cards from the, that read the capsule. Uh, back to Tala Hospital, or, or indeed some of you may have posted them back to me in, in Tala. Um, I think the difference is from our side that if you have patients referred from, you know, Letterkenny Hospital or, you know, Kerry or something with, with occult bleeding and they get transferred up, they take the capsule, they go back, it takes a day to pass, then they send the memory card up to us, then we might read it at some stage in the next few days, then we have to approve it, then we post it back down to them, you know, it's all very, very delayed and there's a lot of different bottlenecks in the system when you're talking about um, more peripheral centres, the more remote centres. So we found that it's just allowed us to, um, it's just led us to eliminate the, a, lot, a lot of the um, time delays on our side. We found that when it's, there's a lot of outpatients that we do, that those time gluts still exist in the community uh, or sometimes with others, but I think that the, the time to diagnosis uh, is improved. Quick one. Um, I know we can make this argument for lots of other, uh, lots of other uh, diagnostic tests, but yeah. do you see that the last this may evolve where the last line of reporting will be directed to the patient themselves through their phone, through their device? This is the image of your, yeah. of your, uh, you know, problem, yeah. or uh, yeah. like everything's clear. So you know, as you mentioned, as it rolls out more into the community, do you, do you uh, like envisage that that could happen? Um, I think that it probably will. I don't know whether that's a good thing or not. Uh, some of our European colleagues, for example, have totally self-referrals for endoscopy. So you refer yourself in for an endoscopy and they give you the report and off you go. So there's no, there's no GP middleman. Now, I, I won't, now we have would obviously have access problems with that, uh, capacity problems with that, but I think it's very empowering for the patient. I think it's, uh, you know, it's a good thing and lots of radiological things, again, would send the report straight on. So I see no reason why we wouldn't do that. Uh, we would normally send a copy of the report to the patient anyway. Um, but yeah, I think it gives you that. And that, that again would eliminate some of the time uh, problems that we experience. So it's a good idea. Thanks. And then just finally, kind of just your own personal input into yeah. this project. I mean, people would be very impressed if I said I wrote all the coding and uh, all that kind of stuff, but uh, I didn't. So no, I'm only at Tala the last two years. So it, and I, we do the capsules in the gastro department. So this, uh, well, this was a, uh, a pilot study made by Medtronic. So it's a world first, we have access to this. Um, and we, I suppose, liaising with the drug company, liaising with the shareholders get it set up and approved on our systems uh, but I didn't actually make any of the uh, and I read the capsules and I collected the the, the numbers and the data and the, the surveys but I didn't actually uh, wasn't involved in the creating of the technology and well done for getting over the technical issues I yeah. can assure you James is weren't trying to sabotage the, the Tala uh, presentation <laughs> so
Our next, uh, our next presentation is from uh, St. Luke's Hospital. It's Dr. Jill Nicholson. And Jill is going to talk to us about one year toxicity of ultra, ultra hypofractionated breast radiotherapy, plus or minus sequential boost, and a survey of the patient experience. So, thank you very much, Jill. Again, I'll give you a nod. Just back Good evening, everybody, and thank you for allowing me to speak here today. My name is Jill Nicholson. I'm a radiation oncology SPR working in the St. Luke's network. And today I'm going to present um, our research on the one year toxicity of ultra hyperfractionated breast radiotherapy and a survey of patient experience. So, just to give you a bit of an introduction and background, in March 2020, we had a landmark change in practice with the rapid implementation of a new radiotherapy regime for adjuvant breast cancer treatment. So this involved delivering 26 gray over five fractions over the course of one week. This obviously coincided with the outbreak of COVID-19 um, and was motivated by that and the publication of the Fast Forward trial. And the Fast Forward trial was an international multi-center non-inferior randomized trial looking at two ultra hyperfractionated regimes. And they, with the result of, with, as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak, rapidly published their five-year and efficacy and toxicity outcomes for their ultra hyperfractionated regime. The reason we implemented this was to try and reduce the number of appointments our patients had and therefore reduce the risk of infection, but without compromising on their cancer outcomes. So for the non-radiation oncologists in the room, just to put this into a bit of context, what I'm talking about. So adjuvant breast radiotherapy is radiotherapy we delivered to the entire breast after a patient has had breast conserving surgery. And the role of this is to try to reduce the risk of cancer recurrence and in general it reduces it by about half. When delivering any radiotherapy it's always a balance between targeting any cancer cells and preserving the normal tissue surrounding that. And without giving you a full radiobiology lecture it's all to do with the cell cycle, the radiology effects of radiation and in general when cancer cells are dividing and their DNA is about to be exposed, they're more susceptible to the harmful effects of radiation. And because cancer cells divide more rapidly than normal tissue, that's why we can deliver radiation in a safe way. But we always think about the size of the fraction that we're giving, and that can, can have an effect on the longer term tissue, normal tissue complications. So traditionally, the majority of radiotherapy schedules were delivered at two grade per fraction. So the traditional radiotherapy for breast cancer was 25 fractions plus five weeks worth of treatment at two grade, equivalent to 50 grade. In about 2010 onwards, some research got published around using a hyperfractionated regime, which was 40 gray delivered over 15 fractions. And this was shown to be kind of biologically equivalent and safe to normal tissue. But to make the transition from this to this took years of debate in our MDTs and debate at our planning meeting um, and trying to pick out what patients would be most successful for. And eventually we did move to it. But to move quite rapidly to an ultra hyperfractionated regime virtually overnight was a big undertaking. So this involved a huge amount of people. We had to create an RT kind of QA um, to ensure that this new regime was safe and kind of qualify new planning parameters, which we would accept in order to sign off on these plans. Our group has already published some of the acute toxicity on this data. But one of the really interesting figures and the reason this kind of puts this into context as to how vital this was at the time was in the six months and of the patient cohort that I'm about to present, we saved 20,000 minutes on our linear accelerators, about 20,000 minutes on our machines by adopting this new um, technique. So this obviously benefited these patients as they had less exposures, but also other patients who had to be there and meant there was less people in the department at any one time. So back to our study. So this is a multi-center prospective <coughs> observational study. We're aiming to report the late toxicities at one year using patient reported outcome measures and a physician-based assessment, and to explore the feasibility and acceptability of this new treatment regime to patients using a patient reported experience measure. We used the EORTC QLQ BR45 questionnaire and included a physician-based assessment to establish the toxicity at three, six, and 12 months. This questionnaire asks questions such as, do you have any breast pain, any breast swelling? And the answers are not at all, a little, quite a bit, very much, which essentially um, correlate to none, mild, moderate, or marked toxicity. At 12 months, we intended on examining our patients in person, 
But as you can imagine, a year down the line, we were still in the middle of the COVID pandemic, so that had to switch to a video-based physician assessment. And we administered a patient-reported experience measure and questionnaire. So the patient-reported experience measure was a questionnaire including 12 questions, 12 questions which aimed to assess the patient's understanding, experience um, of receiving this ultra-hyperfractionated regime. The questions were based on standard friends that are used for oncological patients in other jurisdictions, and the answers were all worked around a light court scale of strongly disagree, disagree, neither agree nor disagree, agree or strongly agree. So the results. Between March and August 2020, 135 consecutive patients were enrolled in this trial. 33 patients received a boost. A boost in radiotherapy is when we give an additional bit of radiotherapy at the end of your adjuvant radiotherapy. And we do this in patients who are at higher risk of recurrence. These are generally younger patients with potentially positive margins or higher grade disease. The reason this is significant is that in the fast forward trial, they did not actually report their outcomes to patients in boost. They did allow patients to have a boost, but didn't necessarily report on that. In total, 121 patients completed the majority of their assessments, and 30 of them had had a boost. Looking at our patient cohort, the majority of their pa our patients were in their 60s. Most of them had early stage T1 or T2 disease, and the vast majority of them, 87%, were node negative. 96% of our patients had breast conserving surgery and a central node biopsy. And as discussed, because the boost hasn't come out formally in the literature yet, there was a variation in the boost regime that we used at the time. In terms of the results, these are the worst patient reported outcome measures for our patients. And as you can see, at three months time, essentially 76% of patients reported none or mild toxicity. At six months, it was also 76% reporting none or mild. And at 12 months, 82% of patients reported no or mild toxicity. At one year, 17% of patients were reporting a moderate toxicity and 2% a marked toxicity. The most common moderate toxicity was breast pain. That could be attributable both to surgery and radiotherapy. As I alluded to earlier, our plan was to do a physician-based assessment. And when we initially designed the study, we presumed that a year down the line, COVID would be over and we would be examining our patients in person. But alas, we were still in the height of COVID in 2021. So we had to revert to a video-based analysis. So we tried to assess, the, from a physician point of view, the outcome. But actually, only 30 patients agreed to a video analysis. So it's very hard to interpret this data. In terms of the patients with the boost, like I said, we did use multiple boost vaccinations, but actually toxicity was very comparable with 17% reported in moderate toxicity and 3% in marked toxicity. We did do a multivariate analysis, looking at the toxicity compared to various planning parameters, the stage and the chemotherapy received, to see if any of these could relate to toxicity, but there was no significant finding. When we compare our data to that of the international trial, the fast forward, it was very comparable and these very similar kind of outcomes. In terms of significant clinical outcomes, we did want to report on these. We looked at the ipsilateral breast cancer recurrence. We had one incidence of this, it was the rate of 0.7%. This is very much in keeping with the international evidence, which normally reports about a 2% ipsilateral recurrence rate. We had one rib fracture and two episodes of ischemic heart disease, although only one of those patients had actually received left side of breast radiotherapy. The other patient was probably unrelated to a radiotherapy. When we look at the patient reported experience measures, so overall 90% of our patients agreed or strongly agreed that they felt well informed about the option of a one week ultra hyperfractionated schedule. About 88% of patients agreed or strongly agreed they felt well informed about the side effects. Really reassuringly, 94% of our patients felt, felt well supported by the medical team. The majority of these patients we never actually met in person, it was all virtual because we had to prioritize other patients in the department. So this was very reassuring to us. Some of the other benefits that you can see that patients reported was that obviously from an infection control point of view, it was just a reduced overall treatment time and they were able to carry out their other duties. So that was positive for them. So in conclusion, 82% of our patients experienced mild or no toxicity at one year. Adding a sequential boost did not seem to alter the toxicity at one year. 
patient satisfaction with ultra high perfection in the treatment and virtual consultations without video was very high. And 50% of patients did report being open to virtual examinations, but only 25% of patients actually agreed to one. And I guess that probably is understanding and probably shows a limitation in the virtual experience. We presented this data at ASTRO, which is our American Society Radio Oncology Conference in October, and there was lots of interest in it. Um, also, having data that correlates the international trials in our own patient cohort allowed some people who had reservations about these treatments to kind of come on board and feel a bit safer and secure. And this has now been incorporated into our own local guidelines and the National Cancer Control Programme guidelines. Thank you very much. I did not do this all by myself, but I had a huge team of people helping. I'd like to thank them all. Thanks very much, Jennifer. That was lovely. Um, uh, great piece of work. Can I ask you, do you think, um, given the time frame, and you mentioned it yourself, that there was such a long delay with the first change, do you think a non-inferiority trial is the right way to have approached this question? Um, well, I suppose initially the non-inferiority trial was a huge trial that came out of the UK, and the UK have a brilliant ability to carry out huge radiotherapy trials because it's such a big, vast network. And what you were looking at there really was the kind of toxicity, which was normal tissue, as well as the efficacy, which I told us to do with the radiobiology. So the non-inferiority trial just showed us that this was as safe as the first frame was initially thought. That's always reassuring. But how do you account in that for changes in uh, other changes in practice that would have happened in, you know, around that, in terms of different regimens, different surgical approaches, you know, uh, different understanding perhaps of the patient's capacity for surgery and radiotherapy and so on? Because all of those things would have moved along at the same time. Yeah, so all of those things would have had an impact. And I suppose the other issue and some of the difficulties in carrying out randomized control trials in this population is that the numbers required are absolutely huge because the number of incidents and number of events are extremely low in breast cancer. And you also need really, really long follow-up, up to about 20 years, and sometimes you need catch-up studies and so on to look at what's going on. Can I ask you also about the patient, well, a couple of things really, about the patient reported outcomes. What about the convenience factor? So I know you, you asked about the toxicities, but what, what about other... Um, things that are of value to, to a patient in this situation. So the fear of getting infected, do you think that would have had an effect then that might not last on? Or yeah, so that was one thing that we did think, and that definitely came through in the, in the patient report experience survey. But actually, it was the more practical things that people found the benefit in, so just having a shorter treatment duration. A lot of these patients have caring duties, looking after either young family members or elderly family members, or a lot of these patients are still working actually that was a huge factor and had a much higher kind of effect than actually the infection control consideration. Yeah. And the I, cost associated with travelling and the night treatment as well. Yeah, I, th I think we don't ask enough about that really, about the, those kinds of things that, that are just your day-to-day -day practicality yeah. of coming and having treatment and you're stuck in a place all day, you know, even though St. Luke's is a very nice place to be <laughs> stuck if you're stuck at all. And um, that's, that's my question for you. Thanks very much. That was an um, excellent talk. I, I suppose I'm kind of interested in the unintended things that pop up in these studies that happen over COVID. So um, there's just something that I, that I picked up on there is the acceptability of patients for a virtual consultation. Or, and as, as you said, I can imagine the reasons why. Um, from the physician point of view, did you do much assessment of how the physicians felt, from do, felt about doing that or, or the, the acceptability of the, of the examiners? Where patients did consent, was there any problems from the from the examination side or for the from the doctors side of thing in making an assessment over phone or over whatever? So I suppose initially when we started discussing this, similar to a lot of things from HP and similar to my previous speaker, um, the initial concerns amongst the doctors were all about just practicalities and technicality and whether a patient would be able to carry out the video consultation and what app we would use, etc. And actually we were able to overcome that fairly easily. Um, but it was some of our male colleagues who initially said, I don't understand, you know, how is this going to work? I won't have a chaperone in the room. I'm asking someone to expose themselves on video. How will that work? And, you know, that did create issues. Um, it was definitely something that we had to kind of start. I mean, 
it, it did change over time, actually, because we were surprised, actually, there, you know, there were a few patients, we were 50% of patients reported they were open to it. And we thought, okay, well, that's actually not too bad. But obviously then when it actually came to it, only 25% of them actually agreed to it. So yeah, that was something we would definitely have to reconsider if we were to do it again. Well, thank you. That was a lovely study. Um, I'm an endocrinologist from Paul Liege Hospital. So um, from, I suppose, in our diabetes, where we did, um, we still do a remote uh, structure education program for people with type 1 diabetes. So it also, I suppose, um, we also struggle to have a patience to kind of stick to the, the virtual structure education program kind of weekly, ongoing basis, et cetera. And there was about 20%, is it 25% in your study that they consented for their virtual consultation later on. But did you explore about the patient experience and what perspective they don't like, they drop out from study, et cetera, uh, you know, and especially follow on? Um, so we did do a little bit of exploration around that. And actually it was all to do with the examination. So actually most patients were quite keen for the idea of a video consultation. And, you know, we're open to that. And once we explained the technology was going to be very simple, they were just a text message at the time, they'd click on the link and that would work. There was no downloading apps, you know, they, they shouldn't need any tech support to do it. But it was the idea of being examined on camera that was what actually turned the patients off. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our next uh, two speakers are from uh, Midlands Regional Hospital in Tullamore. So we have Darren Maloney and Christopher Fennell. They're going to talk about introducing a digital platform for orthopedic patient care coordination in Midlands Regional Hospital. <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Uh, my name is Christopher Fenlon, um, and Darren Maloney is here. We'll um, I suppose present this presentation jointly. We're two orthopedic SPRs. Um, Darren's currently in Tullamore. I'm now uh, down in Cork. Um, and so we'll just present our um, our quality improvement project in the orthopedic department in uh, Tullamore. Just a bit of background. So trauma and orthopedics, um, I suppose, one of the busiest surgical specialties. Um, we so. MSK injuries uh, cause you know a third of all ED attendances. So it's 18 hospitals in Ireland that um, I suppose, uh, 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 provide or tra trauma and orthopedics care, um, and we amount to a third of all acute surgical procedures, as well as amount to about 20,000 procedures per year, and about 200,000 fracture related cases. So in Tullamore, we have a 24/7 orthopedic trauma service. We have two peripheral ED referral sites, as well as obviously ED in Tullamore referring to us. We have a daily trauma theater, and just as a bit of background, um, the trauma assessment clinic or the virtual fracture clinic, um, which is now, I suppose, you know, um, used in the majority of units around the country, was first introduced and piloted in Tullamore. So I suppose Tullamore is a good um, background about, I suppose, introducing change and um, I suppose change for uh, uh, the better. So I suppose our problem is in orthopedics, all our, all our um, so patient coordination is paper-based. So our daily theater list, our patient inpatient list, um, and then our, I suppose, virtual fracture uh, clinic assessments, they're all paper-based for manual entry, ultimately it results in poor communication, and often referral information on the um, virtual fracture clinic assessments is incomplete. It doesn't provide us any real-time information of what we're doing, and no one system, our inpatient, our trauma list, and our virtual fracture clinic links it all together. So just a bit of background. So traditionally, someone broke a bone, they went to A&E, they were referred to a fracture clinic. Now what's happening, and it was piloted initially in Glasgow in 2011, is the patient goes to A&E, they break a bone, they're then, their images are virtually reviewed by an orthopedic consultant, and a decision is made on whether they need to come to a uh, fracture clinic. Um, so just uh, so I uh, started in Tullamore back in uh, July of uh, uh, 20, or sorry, July of 2021. Um, I've always had this problem traveling around all the sites. Uh, I've worked in about 10 different hospitals now in, in Ireland and it's all paper-based. And so I started um, a master's in digital health transformation through uh, University of Limerick, the HC Digital Transformation Department. Um, and I suppose I worked with another uh, student on that master's. This is Ian McGovern, who was a, a physiotherapist up in uh, Drogheda. And I suppose we had the same, he was coming from the physio side, I was coming from the uh, orthopedic side. And so we just, I suppose there's, we just did some um, 
pretty simple analysis of what we say communication error. So this was a um, simple thing whereby a patient was given an appointment um, and would turn up for the wrong day. Sometimes patients were, um, I suppose they never turned up back up to a, a fracture clinic when they were supposed to. They presented back to the ED department and we could see throughout the number of months we analyzed there were a number of communication errors. And then I suppose there was a huge NCHT workload about inputting a lot of this, um, I suppose, um, data into be it Excel spreadsheets, spreadsheets that were then used for the virtual fracture clinics or for um, our on-call um, or for the on-call team. So what we wanted, we wanted a digital platform that we could all see, we wanted to be interoperable with the hospital administration system, we wanted a standardized system, and ultimately we wanted to improve care to improve patient care. Um, and provide ultimately real-time information on what we were doing in orthopedics, and it needs to be safe and secure in keeping with GDPR and the HSE's uh, safety policy. So in January 2021, uh, was when I started the, ma uh, the Masters, we engaged the stakeholders in, in Tullamore uh, and applied for some spark seed funding. We're successful in getting a, a funding of €3,000. Um, as part of the Masters, um, I presented to the uh, HSE Digital Solutions Board Martin Curley at the time and to the Irish, uh, so I suppose he's a the main patient organization. Um, and for Ian's, uh, so we initially, myself and Ian, worked separately. Ian's uh, uh, project actually was the best of the 30 presented, and mine was second. And so we kind of so was joined together. And ultimately, what we did in October and December uh, 2021 is we came up with a uh, we have vendor procurement, so we have to um, come up with a business case um, and do a, so a request for an RFP request for a tender document. And so three as so as vendors, um, the uh, so as the the business case was sent to three vendors, and they came back with um, with I suppose uh, prices and what they could do, and ultimately um, a single vendor, and that vendor was Open Medical, uh, was chosen. So the Pathpoint eTrauma platform is a digital cloud-based platform. It's well kind of utilized throughout the UK, and it was designed by two orthopedic surgeons about ten years ago, um, and it's fully operable with all electronic health. Uh, records and ultimately it's been I suppose, widely used in the NHS and ultimately what it does is provide a single location for surgical theatre list scheduling, a daily inpatient management and a virtual fracture set, set assessment clinic. So we uh, pilot, so they were chosen in December, in January 2022 we did our information evenings in Tullamore um, speaking to ED staff, nursing staff and theatre staff and ultimately Open Medical came and visited in February 2022 and in March 2022, we launched. So we launched actually in Tullamore and also in Strathill as well. Um, and so what went on from that is um, eventually the virtual fracture clinic was launched in June. And what's happened now is um, we've gone on to a formal HSE tender um, and Open Medical was chosen up in Drogheda. And what that has meant is that we now hopefully will be able to roll this project we started in Tullamore and in Drogheda out to, I suppose, other sites um, around the country in orthopedics. Um, so what uh, Darren just going to present now is I suppose what it looks like and I suppose how we use it and then some of the what we say the real time information or data and um, it provides us with. I suppose um, uh, this was relatively easy uh, for me. Um, I came into Tullamore and um, Chris had done the bulk of the work. I actually got a phone call from one of the bosses and I was told he poured his blood, sweat and tears uh, into this project and uh, I had to keep it running. Um, and it was easy because it simply works. It's a uh, very easy software to use. I'll just show you how uh, some of that works. So basically you can log in uh, to Pathpoint uh, from any uh, computer in the hospital or you can log into it on your phone or you can log into it on your home laptop uh, with, out of, um, with uh, a code that you access through Google Authenticator. Um, you basically, this is the open, the first page you come to, uh, you get some stats um, and you get a few details. You get tabs across the top, which are um, procedures, uh, referrals and assessments. If you tick, if you tick into your summary, uh, you can basically get your stats for the uh, last few weeks, last few months. Uh, so you can see we average about eight admissions per day in Tullamore. Uh, and uh, at the time that uh, this screenshot was taken with 41 current inpatients. And you can see all this various data uh, stratified into various graphs down along. Um, the next thing you can click into is your procedure planner so you can get an idea of uh, the operations that are going on each day. You can rearrange these um, and you can print them out so they can be distributed through uh, theater onto the boards. And anybody can see this from 
uh, across the hospital who have access to a uh, platform so they know what's going on, who's getting done, um, and things can be changed across team members. And you can also communicate through this uh, app as well. Uh, this is an example of a patient's uh, file. Um, I suppose I have another story uh, from Tullamore. I worked as an SHO in Tullamore before uh, Chris uh, started um, as an SPR. Um, and I came back to Tullamore as, uh, uh, as an SPR and I found a box of my old referrals uh, in one of the presses. And it was a cardboard box full of A4 sheets all scribbled in with kind of important documents and ultimately these were all patient details and what had happened over the year that I'd worked in Tullamore. And now we had this, so it's a massive difference. So this is what a page for one patient looks like ultimately. You have the first line here is the referral. So I got a call about this person, they had this injury. Next one is their admission. So they come into hospital, you write an admission note in the software, anybody can see it from anywhere print that out and you put it in the file and then you can click procedures you can schedule them for a surgery and when you're finished that surgery you can write a note so you can come back look at that patient if anybody calls you from anywhere you can type in their MRN and you can see this person was referred on this date they were uh, admitted for these many days they had this procedure and this is what happened during the procedure without tracking down notebooks without uh, tracking down um, sheets of paper in a box under the press it's all there for you. Um, so it is very, very easy to use. So this is just some of the data, um, I suppose, from the last year. Um, so we looked at um, our workload uh, over the last year. So we found that um, our trauma load has increased uh, dramatically uh, in the last year. So since we've implemented at that point, and you can feel it in the emergency department uh, and in the orthopedic department, our acute referral volumes have gone up by 40%. And this has been, that point has been instrumental in the quality improvement of keeping track of all of those patients. Uh, we can see also that when planning kind of service provisions, um, we can see, we can stratify the patients by various body parts. So we can see 45% of our referrals are upper limb uh, referrals and upper limb problems. And we have two and a half whole time equivalent upper limb surgeons in the department. So we can, we can plan for uh, service provisions in the future with a software like this. You can also see that a lot of our referrals come from out of hospital. Uh, we had 2,517 referrals to the Virtual Fracture Clinic, and 92% of them were um, from offsite, Mullingar and Port Leash. And then you can see what happens in Virtual Fracture Clinic. So you can see that uh, where each patient went from Virtual Fracture Clinic, some went directly to physio, occupational therapy, but uh, some went to clinical follow. But overall, we were dis we were discharging over fifty percent before they ever came to an in person uh, fracture clinic, which was an increased number from when we previously uh, studied it, and we found that thirty thirty three percent of people were being discharged directly. We can see how various months affect um, our key performance indicators. So in orthopedics, we look at how quick do we get our hip fractures to surgery? Do we get them to surgery in two days? Um, uh, it's part of the Irish hip fracture uh, guidelines. And we can see here over the course of the year how our length to surgery changed. We can see highlighted in yellow through the winter pressures when there's high numbers of patients uh, in the hospital, our time to surgery went down uh, during this period. So that allows you to plan for these months and years ahead. I suppose most importantly for quality improvement, we found that overall the reduction in length of stay that we've had since using uh, PatPoint uh, has been a reduction in 1.4 days. Um, and you can feel that we use this uh, software every morning to do our ward runs, every evening to track what happened for each patient every day. We can communicate with a consultant um, or anybody involved in that patient's care through the software. You can notify a consultant about what's happened during the day and get a plan back. Uh, from uh, that consultant. So overall, since this has been implemented, we've uh, had 8,000 patients managed through the platform. We've seen a 40% increase in our acute referrals during that time. We've had a reduction in length of stay of 1.4 days. There's been 2,700 operation notes entered through this system, and there's been an increase to 50% discharge rate through uh, from VTAC. Um, so 
ultimately, uh, I suppose, Pat point, it's a single location for your uh, operative notes and non-operative and virtual fracture clinic uh, referrals. You track everything uh, through this software. Um, thank you very much. That's a really lovely presentation. Thanks very much. That was very interesting. Can I ask you, um, is it the only system you use now, or do you still have a paper-based system in the background? So I suppose just, uh, to, so how it works is I suppose it is our what we say patient flow and coordination. It's not an electronic health record that we would have here in James's. So we're not writing um, your progress notes into it. And mm. um, so you do have your paper-based notes, and we're still it's all you know patient progress and documentation is written in the patient notes, but. Uh, this is really just about communicating, as Darren pointed out, we can literally, as I said, notify consultants of, the, you know, this patient's come in under your care. Um, so it's really just, and I suppose the big thing is, you know, the, the nurse managers can see it, the admin staff can see it, uh, theatre staff can see it, we can see it, and uh, people go, oh, but should, like, um, do the theatre staff need to see who's on the ward? No, they don't. And so how, through the system, what you can do is you limit access. You can, mm -hmm. so you can obviously maybe, Nursing admin needs the full access. We need the full access, but the theatre staff only need to see what the theatre, what's on the theatre mm -hmm. list. Uh, you know, the, the secretary is maybe you know different. So you can kind of it's um it's very safe. You know, it's not everyone has full access to all these patient details, and it's all password protected. It's two factor authentication, and it's gone through the full HSC remit of data protection and everything. And do you find that because it is good and it's visual and in the moment that people tend to use it as if it was an electronic health record? And therefore, don't actually, you know, properly do up the original notes. Or do you find that's not the case? Because it's very nice to have that combination of a mm -hmm. bit of an EPR and a bit of a Power BI kind of thing, where you can sort of see what your referral patterns and all that are like. Yeah, I suppose we're using it as kind of a a, a hybrid, I suppose, mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, what what is happening, um, I suppose, uh, currently in the hospital is uh, we, we, we do a ward round printing off a list off of this every morning. There's handwritten notes written in the chart, but at the end of the day, when we say, okay, we made a plan for this patient, say um, we needed blood sun today and we needed a post-op x-ray. In When we sit down in the office in the evening, we go through our 40, uh, or, uh, 40 or 50 patients we have, we can just type in very quickly, x-ray reviewed, bloods were okay, and then notify all the various parties of that at the end of the day. So there's a notification at the end of the day that what was written in the uh, note was done by the end of the day, if you know what I mean. So that's how I've kind of used it over the last few months, especially, you know. So to stop two parallel systems developing, which is obviously the danger, I guess, how, and you want to validate this, if, how are you going to go about validating this as a source document? And what level of computer system validation do you plan to undergo in order to make this the source document so so i suppose that so what what i suppose the company itself is we would say that this is so this is really just to improve communication mm -hmm. about patient care and um, ultimately the patient chart is the you know is the record that is what the you know kind of physiotherapist the occupational therapist you know everyone the, the mdt you know kind of i suppose communicates ultimately through this just i suppose helps the mdt to find it so there is very simple function is the, all the hip fractures, you can literally, you can hit, you know, hip, you know, hip tab, and they all come up. So the videos go, right, these are the hip fractures, they've been checked, you know, done yesterday, they know the first day, you know. So they, it's, it's just they making them, their job easier to identify and locate the patients that need to be treated. Um, and I suppose being up, I don't think this is, this won't be an electronic healthcare record. And it can be integrated with an el el electronic healthcare record with Millennium or Cerner, as they use here in James. But it's, the big, the big thing from my side, it was com communication. It was to, you know, Darren's on call on a Monday. He gets a referral. Um, there's nothing, you know, nothing written down. I then get a call, a referral the next day, and I go, I don't know anything about the patient. So through this platform, we can document this. And where we, where you see it, I suppose the benefits of it, um, kind of two settings. For us, we get referrals from one of our hospitals saying we've got this patient with right hip pain, and before that was all purely, you know, over the phone, and unless we had no fair intel on what to document that ever happened bar putting it on a word excel document that also ultimately went to the bin and um, whereas now we get we everything is documented through this so that we we can go back and say no darren saw that on monday this was the plan it was discussed with the last consultant so that's one thing from outside hospitals and then the second thing is the virtual fracture clinic which is really changes so 
the virtual fracture clinic is done before the um the I suppose the admin staff people think what piece of paper this is your injury put in an envelope send it to the patient now what the patient gets is a they get a text message straight away with their this is your time or this is your injury and it says links to I suppose none of like a number of videos this is your injury this is the exercise to do so I suppose from an environment point of view you know don't have all that paper waste none of all the patients you know is traveling to the clinic and also you have a quicker better communication the so there's key performance indicators by the HSC that the virtual fracture clinic has to be assessed within 72 hours we can see from this system that over 90 to 95 percent are being assessed within that 24 hours which means the patient is ultimately getting an answer on their injury within that time frame and, and I think it will it is so currently I suppose Limerick Cork um, and Sligo are kind of in the range of kind of piloting and I think this will hopefully through this project and through some more will become uh, potentially a national system for orthopedics that will give us all the data everything we're doing uh, from it and it will feed into other systems like post practice database and I think it will I think it will make a big difference. Very well explained. Thanks very much um, Chris and Darren. I have a quick one sorry I'm conscious of time. So you attributed the system, I suppose, to um, reductions in time for surgery and length of stay in the hospital. How confident are you that it's the system itself that's driving that, yeah. or are there other things that might be impacting yeah, it as well? I agree. So exactly, the length of stay, so that you know, f figure is, let's say, you know, three four point five. It's purely multifactorial. So doctors change, you know, the, the patient change, obviously bed pressures, etc. Uh, ultimately, what I'd say is that I couldn't have told you that a year ago. I had no idea if the length of stay was going up or down, what we were doing, what we were treating. Um, like you know, what we say is you know if you um, if you don't you can't you can't manage what you don't measure or you know whatever you can't that's that's phrase exactly right. But ultimately, we were doing all this work. We weren't expecting any of it really. We had no idea really what we were doing. But now we can give you our data straight away exactly what we're doing. Um, and you know from a big thing so in the theater side of things, so patients get cancelled. We can now every time a patient is cancelled, a reason is reported. I can now give you straight away with five patients. You know we've had. 200 patients cancelled surgery, the reason was we, you know, over, over on the theatre, patients weren't well. You know, I, essentially, we now know what we're doing, and so now we can act on, act on what we're getting. But I think, yes, it's just stuff like the, the length of stay and all that stuff is multifactorial, and I don't think it's simply this system, but at least we know what we're doing now. Thank you. And I think we have time. I just ask him on position from Polish Hospital, so obviously Kilmore is our regional center for orthopedics. Um, I'm not directly obviously involved in a minor injury unit, but they do have a system that link with Tullamore. Is it the same system they're using? Yeah. I heard they're quite happy with the, you know, the link and et cetera. And also the, you have like 2,000 referral off-site. Do you have data from how many from Portlaoise, from how many from Mullingar? Yeah, so exactly. So um, I think it's 1,100 are from, from both sites. Okay. Um, and I suppose just the last thing you mentioned, so we'd often, so they are now using it to sort of refer in. Normally, you know, the orthopedic on call a service would get a call. They don't answer it for hours. Now this is logged, so we can now even... So if we on. send orthopedic consults from inpatients, it'll go to that system as well? So it, it will in time. We haven't, I suppose, you know, done that exactly yet but that will be the next step whereby you'll just log it on it we'll see it and we'll act you know act on it. okay thank you uh, no that's all right i think uh, darren answered the question chris so it was your blood sweat and orthopedic <laughs> tears <laughs> that uh, you put into it so well done um, <laughs> so our Next presentation is from uh, the Coombe Hospital. So Miles Fishcroft is here and he's going to talk about regional anesthesia alert bracelet, empowering patients for safer and better obstetric anesthesia care. And uh, Miles is going to be the last of the oral presentations. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Miles. I'm an anesthetic SHO in the Coombe at the moment. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about a quality improvement project that we completed this year. And I've entitled it Regional Anesthesia Alert Bracelet, Empowering Patients for Safer and Better Obstetric Anesthesia Care. And I'll just kind of briefly discuss the background, what recommendations currently exist, what happened that we felt we needed to change something, and our subsequent experience with the, the project. So severe complications like spinal canal hematomas and abscess are extremely rare, but they can have devastating consequences. Uh, consequences. The third national audit project in 2009 
um, which was looking directly at the complications from anorexia anesthesia. Um, quoted the number as around 1 in 50,000 for paraplegias, but they did also identify that um, failure to identify the relevance of inappropriately weak legs after sentinorexia blockade can lead to avoidable harm. Similarly, the Obstetric uh, Anesthesia Association and the Anesthesia Association of Great Britain uh, have also recommended straight leg raising should be used as a screening method to assess motor block at four hours from the last dose of epidural and spinal anesthetic. Um, on a more kind of global, larger, general sense, um, the patient safety strategy states one in eight patients suffer harm while using healthcare services and up to 70% of this harm could have been prevented. So we wanted to try and kind of align our care with the current recommendations while utilizing recommendations from the patient safety strategy to use patients as kind of an advocate for their own health. And that is the number one uh, strategy to um, you know, empower engaged patients as well as staff all the while anticipating and responding to risk. So what we were doing at the COOM we were just, we had a daily pain rounds and reviewing day one post cesarean sections and every patient would receive an epidural in the last 24 hours. It was high volume, it relied on a physical book in an office where the person who did the epidural went to put the sticker in. So it was all very low tech and of course it wouldn't account for any time sensitive complications. Um, and essentially it wouldn't account, for, it led us to kind of a scare. So what happened was we had a lady, a 32-year-old, first pregnancy. She had spontaneous rupture of membranes, induction of labor, and she had an epidural during pregnancy. Um, she was only found about 24 hours later um, on the epidural round um, with quite a, quite a significant motor weakness. Uh, she had three to five power in right uh, hip flexion extension, plantar dorsiflexion and she it was severely limiting her mobility and she couldn't straight leg raise. So we have, um, ultimately she was diagnosed with ephemeral compressive neuropathy, but if it had been something more time critical like a hematoma, we would have completely missed the opportunity to appropriately investigate and manage that. Um, so that's kind of famous Swiss cheese model and you know the alignment of multiple points of failure can lead in disasters. So the things we knew we needed to address, there's current no current screening strategy for straight leg raids of four hours post neuroaxial in Ireland, um, despite the recommendations. We probably needed more patient information about the likely time scale for the resolution of the block, but crucially, more acutely, we needed a method to trigger a review if the patients were unable to straight leg raise at the four hour mark. So that's kind of where this region anesthesia alert bracelet came into it. It's the application of a bright yellow wristband to the patient's arm. Um, and it states, can you res raise each leg up at, we fill in the time, four hours post. And we tell them, explain to the patient, just raise each leg up four hours after. If you're happy with that, rip off the wristband, throw it away. If you have any concerns at all, then the, a, an anesthetic review is triggered, essentially. So this... Alert brace has been widely adopted in the UK, but the Coombe will be, is the first um, hospital in the Republic of Ireland. So triggered by the scare, we thought we'd utilize the alert band to kind of engage patients in their care, to avoid these time sensitive complications, and just to bring ourselves up with the current recommendations from multiple organizations. So from the, for the QI project itself, we got institutional approval from ACRA, which is our governing body at the Coombe. We used the um, IHI model of improvement, which lays out a few key questions. What are we trying to accomplish? How we know that uh, a change is an improvement? And the plan do study act cycles, which are the PDSA cycles. So our aim was to, from essentially 0%, achieve a minimum of 70% self-monitoring of motor function after neuroaxial anesthesia at the uh, Coombe Hospital. And really important in QI, just have is just follow the high quality methodology that was out there. So that was our initial SMART objective. And it was just to lay out what we were measuring, the patient questionnaires, non-removal uh, bracelets, trigger review, and that our intervention, the bracelet itself is practical. It's minimal cost and easy to implement. So for the second part, how do we know that the change would be an improvement? So these are our measures. So for the outcome measures, it was the daily recording of the number of patients who performed the straight leg raise screening and self-reported timing. For the process measures, we were looking at the number of patients who received uh, the wristband following their axial anesthesia and the correct time noted, 
and with the balance measures, um, one of the difficulties with the QI that can possibly hinder QI is does this unnecessarily create work for everyone? So we just wanted to monitor for possibly increasing workload and also a patient satisfaction survey just to see how it was received by the patients themselves. So for our first cycle, our first PDSA cycle, we had 100 patients, were they self-screening and when, and as well as a patient feedback form and just an impact on workload by looking at the gaps as well. So we wanted to do our first trial run in a kind of more controlled environment, and that was we just chose initially elective sections in normal working hours, and of course have stood on what we were looking at there as well. Um, so following this initial cycle, we decided to open up into all um, all cases, essentially elective emergency, all time of day and night. And then we also introduced them to a new place, which is the delivery suite for uh, the April, uh, epidural um, analgesia. And so with the wristband now as kind of a universal thing in the coom following your axial anesthesia, we repeated with additional 50 patients just to see where we achieving our measures. And we found that everyone wearing the bright yellow wristband were actually, you know, performing a straight leg raise. 77% um, of them self-screened on time. The average delay of those who were delayed was a little less than two hours. So there wasn't this, we weren't seeing any massively prolonged delays like we saw that triggered the initial case that triggered all of this. There was also no impact on workload and of the reviews triggered, um, there was only four and they're all sensory with no motor components. So no imaging was required. And the patients themselves were very happy with it with it, 97 said felt actively involved in their healthcare, 94 felt reassured, and it didn't cause anxiety in anyone, and uh, all would wear the bracelet again for a similar procedure. And some even gave us some nice quotes and reviews. So we were getting good reviews from patients, good involvements with the uh, bracelets and self-screening, but as everyone knows, it can be very difficult to introduce them some, something new to a hospital. And um, so we just wanted to do further things to ensure that the practice was kind of cemented as routine in the coom. So we had some additional things. We wanted to make sure everyone was on board involving nursing, midwifery. We needed senior support, get our NCHD, fellow NCHGs to do it, especially middle of the night near the end of a 24 hour call. We need to get all the wristbands sorted and we need to get them into multiple, multiple locations in the hospitals. Another thing we started doing was we introduced QR codes in various places. I, for the sake of time, I won't play the video. Just give some further information about what they should be doing because it can be a little hard to explain it to someone who's in active labor you know so it's just a reminder that afterwards once they've had the baby that they can just look at that again and antenatally we wanted to target people just to so that they were aware of this even before they came into the hospital and so that's just links to the kind of pain reliefs during labor the qr codes that we've placed on our antenatal patient information leaflets um so um one of the major difficulties, another difficulty with QI is that um, sustainability can be a difficult factor. Short bursts of enthusiasm for something new and then going back to old habits and really QI. So we need to set up things that will outlast me and my fellow NCHT when we rotate. So we needed designated wristband coordinators identified each areas, CNM in theater, CNM in the labor ward. And we also needed a uh, consultant uh, backing. Uh, so from this point on will be Dr. Stephen Smith, consultant anesthetist, as well as those reg uh, antenatal information and going forward or forward regular audits just to ensure compliance. And as well as sustaining in our own site in the Coombe, we hope to expand to another site with the second site potentially planned in Drada. And hopefully for the sites, I'll be speaking tomorrow at the um, tripartite meeting of obstetric uh, anesthesia that's between the Coombe, Rotunda and Hollis Street to see if they have any interest in uptaking across Dublin. And as well, there is an application for this in a non-obstetric setting. Um, the 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 non-obstetric epidurals are, um, represent a minority, but they represent more than half the complications, usually due to more major surgeries, and also they're a lot sicker of a cohort, but there may be an application for it there. Um, so in conclusion, it's a simple idea. Uh, it's, you know, effective patient safety initiative for, you know, increasing screening for complications following your axial anesthesia. And just kind of going back to the HSC patient safety strategy, this project has increased patient engagement, achieved really good in, uh, uptake by staff and patients, and is based on this premise of 
anticipation and prevention of uh, complications. So, thank you. Right. Uh, thanks very much. That was that was an excellent talk, and uh, you brought me back in time to the coom to about five and a half years ago when I was there with my wife and she got a, um, an, a, an epidural. I remember being uh, twitchy about it at the time and now I realise why. Um, so I suppose, um, and you have great data there and I suppose yeah, uh, questions that popped into my mind as you were talking kind of were answered with the, uh, the theory I suppose and, and the methodology. Um, in relation to the scale up and spread, um, how did you find that particular process or do, how did you, I suppose, make sure that incoming NCHGs and uh, kind of other staff, I suppose we're all aware of a high turnover in hospital mm -hmm. now, but um, I suppose how did you cement that or how did you go about that because I suppose the scale up and spread of QI is quite a topical area in that. Yeah, area. so we were kind of con conscious of that. So one of the major things from from the anesthetic side is now we have that consultant leader who's very enthusiastic. Another major thing was kind of the, everyone around the CNMs of the theatres, of the labour wards, were really instrumental in educating the midwives and everything. And now we're finding that people, even if they're forgetting to put on the wristband, they're being reminded by the midwife, no, no, this is what we do now. So there is these things that obviously will be difficult and will take a push to maintain those, but it's those kind of just surrounding things that we hope will help continue it and outlast us. And um, the other thing is about the QR codes, actually, because I suppose the QR code has uh, had the greatest comeback in history, I suppose, during COVID um, in, in, I suppose, the use of and spread of information. Has the uptake of that particular, because I think everybody uses QR codes now and they're quite aware of them, ha has, have the patients found that useful or even patient relatives? Um, um, we haven't formally kind of looked into that as it is pretty new. We've only just got the, risk, the QR codes onto the wristbands in the last few weeks. But I would be interested to look into it, I, I suppose, with obstetrics, you have a younger, healthier cohort who's far more interested in being really involved in their care. So it is a kind of good entry port for QR codes, I think, in healthcare with that kind of population. But we haven't formally looked into that yet. Very nice. Really enjoyed that. Can I ask you when um, do do you get if some does somebody check that that the patient is correct in what's happening that they're that they're actually straight leg raising appropriately and that they're you're not still missing something in a kind of halo of good good feeling you know yeah so that that was that was something at the start that's kind of where we started with the elective sections during the day it was something that we could actually go at them after the four hour mark to be like did you and that was kind of our trial run essentially so that was kind of we use that to kind of infer further with when you kind of expand into the, the chaos that can be the labor ward uh, that happens any time or day or night that that can be difficult to follow up in that but we were seeing good compliance and that's where we kind of assessed it in that controlled environment before we essentially released it to the rest of the hospital and do nurses on the ward perhaps routinely check that the patient has you know that, that the patient is correct correctly assessed that they're now over the epidural yeah they do well they we have teaching from the the we have support from the ADONs for those wards so yeah. that's kind of our only really point that we could say but we have had meetings with the nurses and they have have positive you know feedback from them but I suppose it's hard to say for definite whether you know it is routinely um yeah, the being case. surveyed yeah and has it changed in any way your trigger you know in the sense so say, have you changed the pathway from an abnormal result or somebody shouts out to me, so I haven't been able to straight leg raise and it's six hours now or whatever. Yeah. Has that altered in any way? Um, I suppose it, it was just to give a timeline for it because previously what that kind of case highlighted was we weren't, we couldn't rely on that system. That, 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 that's what it showed us. And apparently, and speaking to some of the consultants as well, that they, they, they have kind of colloquially similar events that have happened throughout the years where they've missed 24 hours, two days, the long weekend, and someone was just left there. So it's not saying that. And yes, we would, uh, prior to this, they would have been alerted if they had an anesthetic issue on the ward, but sometimes it just simply wasn't recognized. And that was one of the kind of the holes we wanted to fill for just preventing another layer to prevent against an error. Very good. Thank you. I just have one more. I forgot to ask. Um, 
is the Epic Jewelry book still in existence or is it gone? Uh, that is still in existence for now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks very much, Miles. Um, so we're going to mo move into the adjudication part now. So we're going to break for about uh, 15 to 20 minutes and an opportunity to, for people to get fed. I'd like to thank uh, all uh, five presentations who were fantastic. For people who are uh, joining us virtually, the poster presentations will play uh, uh, for about 90 seconds each uh, in the background. Um, which will bring us up to the kind of the 15 20 minute mark so we plan to be back here at about about 10 to 8 and just for anyone who's who requires uh, cpd points so this event has been registered with rcsi for three external cpd points so just get in contact with us over the next few days and we'll send you out the necessary uh, certificate cert, uh, certificates uh, so while we're all eating uh, poor Jerry and Martina have the unenviable task of choosing a winner, but I, um, I think everyone, everyone is a winner, and it's a, you know, it's a, uh, the presentations have been so diverse and fantastic, and I think it's a, the term non-consultant hospital doctor is a very, it's a terrible term really, with the standard that, uh, the the quality that people are producing, you know, I think we need to come up with another, another term. So uh, we'll be back here at 10 to and uh, we'll announce the poster winner as well at that stage. Fantastic. So we're, we're back. Apologies for the slight delay. So I'm, before I hand you over to uh, Professor Hennessy, who's going to announce the winners of the oral presentation, I just want to uh, let you know that the winner of the poster presentation, which was judged previously, is uh, Dr. Guhan. Uh, Rangzawami from uh, St. Luke's. I think there's a large, it's a large sheet anyway. Uh, no, yes, here it is. A no expense to spare check here for Dr. <laughs> Wuhan. <laughs> Where are you? Are you still here or are you not here? You don't think they're in there. They're... Will we give you the check? <laughs> no, that's just for. It's yeah. only for looks. It's only for. It's not a real check. Yeah. <laughs> Just say it. It's not a real check. Okay. <laughs> no expenses spared. <laughs> um. So very good. Well, look, I, I'll, uh, uh, this is our second time to do this. And, um, you know, you always wonder if you do it once, what's going to happen the next year? Maybe nobody will come. But we're delighted that the audience was bigger. The standard was very high. I think really good work done. And I think one of the things that really impresses us is the, the efforts that people are going to get around a system that's lucky. Like, you know, when, when you see what you've been doing, in the digital health space, you know, with some of the projects, you just think how much more you could do if you just had an electronic health record that was universal in the country. You know what I mean? So, I think it, there's there's such a lot of talent that uh, it's really impressive. But to keep going and the resilience and effort and the the ends people go to to kind of get good work out there and get it to the patient and have an impact is really impressive. Um, and I wish we had a, another load of fora that we could use to bring forward the, the work that people do. But we've had to choose, and I really didn't want to choose a winner with a little domestic outside <laughs> of the grass, you know, while you were all feasting inside. Um, but uh, we had to choose a winner, and we had to choose a runner-up. Um, and so um, maybe, uh, and, we, and we also wanted to give a particular commendation. So um, we will go in the order of commendation, Yep. There isn't a prize for the commendation, but I, I, we just wanted to mention that um, <coughs> the project from Cocoon with Miles as a commendation, because you are early stage in your own career, and you, the theoretical basis on which you base, you know, the way you presented the theoretical basis of your quality improvement project is just really impressive. 
who had thought of it all and it was very clear that you must have had to work very hard to get everybody on side in what must be a relatively short job you know so i think uh, that your your commitment to making something better really did come through you know and uh, we just wanted to commend you and hope that you will continue that kind of work because it was really exceptional so the number two that we have decided on after a little domestic outside was um, <laughs> uh, just make sure I had this right. Chris and Darren. Chris for Fennell and Darren Maloney. This this was a, a very good book project. I mean we really really liked it and we could only just imagine how much work there was in the background to that and I think the thing that sold us with this one was the, the visual representation of how a team was doing um, all the time you know would really I think reinforce that multidisciplinary dynamic in getting the, the, the impact and the outcomes for the patient so the fact that people I think felt really engaged in checking the theatre list, making sure things were really on board. That is a great sense of achievement in a team. Really, really good sense of achievement. And we, we wanted to commend you on it and hope that the work continues. Um, and we could see a lot of you know other offshoots and benefits that could uh, accrue in many different services by having that kind of uh, technology. You know, we would just, uh, um, you know, we, we, we would wonder about the system's readiness for that level of interoperability, but that's not your problem. You did a great job. <laughs> that's for the uh, slaunch care, perhaps. So, uh, wishing you every success in the future. And we're sure much, that everyone. you'll be on the stock market someday. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we'll be sorry we didn't buy equity <laughs> in your. <laughs> I give you a compliment, if you like. Um, the, the group CEO, Trevor, Trevor O'Callaghan, fractured his clavicle, and he said he wouldn't go anywhere but Tullamore for the orthopedics. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> You've obviously made an impact. And then, so we come, we come to the winner, and undoubtedly, this is just a, a really rigorous piece of work, um, uh, and uh, very well presented with it in enormous clarity of thought, but the standout part of the work, it was the rigor being applied to the experimental method. And, uh, and that, that must have taken a very long time. And I suppose it, it's not that often that you see something that really is a game changer in the way that you can conceive a whole cohort of patients that are going forward. And I, I think that's what kind of sold, sold this piece of work for us. Um, so it, it was very impressive, but um, and we want to recognize also the amount of personal work that's gone into the, such a project and it's Jesse's project um, on, on the esophageal carcinoma patients. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, we thought it were a really stunning piece of work and uh, I think it's, it's a really big piece of work actually. And the, the, so the size and scale of it is going to be quite practice changing. Um, and I think the, the takeaway is that it's not the, your acknowledgements. You've had an enormous list of people who are helping you. And um, that size and scale of project is really only possible when you're really working in a biggish team. And we, um, the, the use of collaboration is a really big factor. Um, in actually pushing things forward. It lets you move from the small to the much bigger and to really design studies very well. And, and cohort, un understanding your cohort so well, um, I think is, is really important. So we, we were very impressed with that. I have to say though, we were very, very impressed with the other projects as well, extremely so. Um, and any, on, a, on any given day, all of them would have had a prize. And if we had had prizes for quality versus clinical research versus 
you know, clinical trial work, you know, we'd, we'd have been standing here with five winners. So I think you can be very pleased with yourselves and, and the work you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> you could say the unsung heroes, you know, the NPHDs, that would be very noisy. <laughs> but perhaps not. <laughs> thank you, thank you, sir. Thanks. <laughs> well done. So just like to thank everyone for uh, coming and staying so late on a t Thursday evening after the end of a, a busy and a, and a hot and a hot week. But just for a bit of consolation to people who didn't travel from Tullamore, it's a lot colder in Dublin, I believe, yeah. than, than it is in, uh, in Tullamore. So hopefully this event will go onwards and we can build on it uh, year on year. So thank you very much. Thank you.